science is humming. Curiosity's high. If you are watching right now, this is the live broadcast of the recording of the Twist Podcast. We're glad that you're here. Thank you for joining us. Oh, are we sounding five by five? Do we have everything we need to put on a good show for all of you tonight? At least something you'll enjoy? I hope so. I really do. We try. We do. We try. We do. Are we there? Oh, we're live. It's good. Justin, say something. Something. <laughs> Blair, say something. Hello. It's September 2nd. Yesterday was Species Requiem Day, so I hope you all celebrated some extinct animals. <laughs> <sighs> this all just goes with my mood for the day. Let me tell you. Let me tell you something. Is Justin still the loud loudest, even though he's the quietest? That's always the question. That's never the thing. It's, <laughs> I'm always the quietest, Mike. Identity 4, it says it sounds great. So let's start oh. the show. Starting in a three, a two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 789, recorded on Wednesday, September 2nd, 2020. Science with a twist. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight we will fill your head with holes, mergers, and something special. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Earth. It's at most a medium-sized planet with a lot of humans. Billions of them, even. More humans than you are likely to run into on any other planet. And despite sharing the same star, each one sees the world in a different light. For the most part, we humans walk past each other, seldom knowing how or what the other thinks about this or that. But every once in a while, we cross paths with one of these humans and strike up a conversation. Every once in a long while, we find that there is another human who sees the world very much as we do has a similar ethic or aesthetic appreciation, chases similar sparks of curiosity into the weeds of contemplation, lighting up the conversation's path like lightning storm on a dry summer's night. Ed Dyer, longtime listener, contributor, and conversation starter here on Twist, was one of those humans for me and for a lot of our Twist family. His spark will be missed, but not forgotten, as he has inspired many of us to keep setting small fires to share our thoughts around and enlighten our paths as we walk this world together. Thank you, Ed, for being a part of why we do This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to feel And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We're back. We are back. Three voices to talk about science for a night. And we are missing our dear friend, Ed. For those of you who uh, knew him, who knew him in the chat room, um, there is sad news of his passing that uh, has come to light. So he's missing from our chat room tonight and he's going to be missing from our lives. And, but his spark, his spark will always live on. Thank you for that great disclaimer, Justin. Thank you. But we have a great show ahead. And in Ed's honor, we are going to hopefully light a spark, hopefully drive some curiosity. I think Ed would want us to keep doing that in oh, yeah. the way that we do. Absolutely. So, 
on we go with the show. What do we have lined up for the show tonight? I have stories about some of those mergers and holes, black holes to be precise. I also have stories about brains because brains are fascinating to me, you know. And yeah, that's that's where I'm going to be heading. What are you doing, Justin? What are you going to talk about? I've got a gut microbiome story. I have got uh, uh, how insects could save the planet, uh, as well as some insane things that bacteria can do that I didn't know that they could do that maybe nobody knew that they could do, but they're doing it, and so they can do it. Uh, I, I want to oh. know what they're doing. What are they doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and wait they, for uh, the show, Kiki. <laughs> yeah, it's a teaser. This is just to keep you watching. Oh, and uh, a, a not a COVID cure, but a last ditch thing that reduces fatalities. That is uh, that uh, based on, well, that's the whole story, basically. <laughs> but, Let's talk about that uh, in our COVID good update. News. A little bit of sort of silver lining in a dark cloud. Well, I hope so. Yeah. Blair, what is in the animal corner? Uh, that's a great question. I plum forgot. No, uh, I, have, <laughs> I have a no. bunch of information about taking better care of lab mice. I have anemones and uh, a little bit about women in science. In the news. Sounds like great news. Can't wait to hear it. So let's dive into the show. And for all of you, if you have not yet signed up for This Week in Science as a podcast, we are available as a podcast pretty much everywhere you find podcasts. Look for This Week in Science. It's that easy. We're also available on YouTube and Facebook, and we now are on Twitch. So try and find us there under Twist T W I S Science. Twist Science. Only one S in there. <laughs> this weekend. And you can science. Twist. This weekend in science. Yes, science. And our website, twist.org. Find us if you can. All right, into some quick <laughs> stories to start our show. I have a story. Let's talk. Let's let's start it off with that black hole merger. Big story out this week that we actually already talked about back in June. Wait, what? Yes, LIGO Virgo. We do love LIGO Virgo, and the LIGO Virgo uh, collaboration, which looks for gravitational waves back in May, detected four little blips in space-time. Little tiny, tiny, four little blips. Like they basically turned on their device and it was like, oh, what are those four little blips? But it took, you know, much cleaning of the information of all of the multiple blips to be able to even detect these almost nearly undetectable blips, which they have now confirmed... Pretty much, they've 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 run analyses and come to the conclusion that the most likely explanation for what they saw in these four little blips was the merger of two stellar mass black holes into a larger, big intermediate-sized black hole. And this is very exciting because we see or we have evidence of stellar mass black holes and we have lots of evidence of the big supermassive black holes, but there's really no evidence of the formation of these mid-sized black holes. And if theories are correct about black hole formation, that as you put black holes together, smaller ones will make bigger ones and those bigger ones will make even bigger ones. If that's correct, then they should have seen this, but they hadn't before. So most likely explanation is that this is the merger of two stellar mass black holes to create an intermediate mass black hole merger, which has never before been seen. Something new. Go science. Go physics. It's very exciting. <laughs> Did you have another story about a merger, Justin? So yeah, this is uh, this is that thing that uh, we were talking about uh, already at the beginning there. Uh, so like humans often do, bacteria will live together in communities. They're working together, taking on different tasks, individual bacterial tasks to sort of fill out the needs of the the society, uh, as it were, of of the bacteria 
so understanding how these interactions work is very important to how antibiotics work and how infectious disease happens and this sort of thing. Researchers at the University of Delaware, while doing that sort of research, uh, discovered that bacteria can do more than just work together. They found bacterial cells from two different species, although closely related, can combine into a unique hybrid cell by fusing their cell walls and membranes and sharing the cellular contents of the internal portion of the bacteria, including proteins, ribonucleic acid, molecules which regulate gene expression, control cell metabolism. In other words, the organisms exchange material and lose part of their own identifiable identity. They I didn't lose write their sense of self. Ask, yeah, is like, <laughs> I assume there would be two nu- nuclei, but... So yeah, this is and this is going way beyond like uh, uh, gene transfer. This isn't little proboscisy uh, things transmitting, you know, spitting DNA into one another. Uh, this is this is apparently an unprecedented observation, which has apparently not been seen before. Which is why it is unprecedented. I think that's the meaning of the word. So this was reported Tuesday. Uh, it's number first, and bio, which is a journal of the American Society for Microbiology. And it, they think it's this could shed light on some unexplained phenomena affecting human health. This could be applied to energy research, biotechnology, a whole lot of other things. Yeah, th- so they mix that. This is a quotey voice from, oh boy, this is going to be a fun. Uh, Elephaterios, uh, it's a Greek name. This is a research team is led by Elephaterios. Papotaxis, well, that's probably pretty close, uh, who's studying the interactions between Clostridium uh, ilium uh, dalii and Actobutylicum. Uh, these are two Clostridium bacteria uh, that are in the same clade, but they're different species. And this is the quote from uh, Papotaxis. They mix their machinery to survive or do metabolism. And that's kind of extraordinary because we always assume that each and every organism has its own independent identity and machinery. Previously, researchers had observed that bacteria could exchange some material through nanotubes. Uh, this is that, that uh, horizontal gene transfer. Uh, but the combination into turning into a hybrid cell itself was unexpected and unseen. This is uh, Camille Charubin, who is a doctoral student in chemical and biomedical engineering and first author of the paper. This is the first time we've shown this in bacteria. And it's also a new mechanism for how material is exchanged between cells, which is because it became the same cell. So why would they do this? Uh, Apparently this is what's really, they are sharing, uh, by sharing this machinery, they're also creating things that the other needs to exist. You know, one bacteria is able to create uh, a protein that the other might not be, and they both get to use it. And it just lessens the amount of work that each needs to do and gives them advantages and access to things that they may not be producing themselves. Pretty, uh, pretty amazing, uh, really. This is not, this is like new, this is like, it, it, like two humans could do this. This isn't just like information yeah. sharing or flapping a gene. It's like, hey, you know, let's be conjoined twins. You want to you wanna do that? Like forget getting married and like sharing a bank account. This is like, let's, you know what? Ah, my liver is not as good as your liver. Why don't we just scrunch together? We'll use your liver. My heart's really good. We could just use that one. That's all we need. It's really wild. So, uh, and it makes me wonder, you know, the, the extrapolation that immediately jumps to mind into this is like, there's so much speciation and evolution that takes place, but this is like, could these possibly reproduce? 
in this state? And then what does that look like? I mean, because they're doing this without sexual uh, genes involved. Right. It's not sexual reproduction. But then, I mean, what this really gets at for me is that there there is for bacteria at least there is very little fine line between different species that you know the fact that they can merge so easily that there's blending that can take place that you know we already knew about horizontal gene transfer this is just like a ramped up version of that where they're like let's just work together here and become one and these hybrid species could then have you know if they work in that environment then they work well. If they don't, they die out. Uh, you know that natural selection would really act on them in that case. Um, I mean, from an evolutionary <laughs> point of view, though, what's like, what this, is to this keep? Is like, is this what is halfway? to keep? What is to keep the membranes from? These are just lipid bilayers, right? What is to keep lipid bilayers in a situation from melding and blurping together with other lipid bilayers? I guess if you just don't do it right, you might both cells might die or one might yeah. die. Yeah. You know? But this yeah. is this is evolutionarily, is this like the half step to the first mitochondria? I mean, is that this sort so- of like it sounds like it would be. Yeah. yeah. So we know that yeah. bacteria can just sort of do this ca- occasionally, I guess, at least. Uh then that that uh, that pathway for our evolution looks like a lot more uh possible like we've seen yeah. the halfway we, we have the missing link to uh to merging bacteria uh you just might get to a point where one's like yeah you can come in but i'm not really gonna share everything yeah yeah <laughs> just too big maybe hey uh, babe you want to smush we <laughs> might kill us or it could yeah be talk it about better. mashing talk about mashing this is the real deal Anyway, yeah. pretty fascinating. Yeah. I, I think I'd, I would love to lo- know more details on you know, where and when this has a tendency to happen or where and when it does not. So when you know if this is one of these early steps to things like mitochondria coming in being uh, and like I guess eaten and endocyt- not endocytized, but just brought into another cell, how does that happen? How does one smaller bacteria get brought into another bacteria and kind of consumed in that way, but not destroyed? How does it, yeah. how does that end up? How, why, why, why? And if, and if they're sharing, if they're at the point where they're sharing, you know, uh, ribosome and RNA, yeah. uh, that's just a hop, skip, and a transposon away from, uh, so gene transfer within the cell, which is how you could get like that this in the 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 uh, prototype eukaryote, uh, where you could sort of see like, oh, this is how it's possibly translating not just the bacteria that's ace or that's sexually reproducing on the exterior cell, but it's also bringing in those elements that are in that cell that it's absorbed. Uh, because with time, they can actually start to mix in that. So, and then, ooh, yeah. Uh, anyway. It's interesting. Yeah. Very thought-provoking. Thank it you. Yeah. Blair, did you have something yeah. special to talk about? Yes. Uh, female scientists, they're important. Um, this is a study from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And this started out as a birdsong study. Um, even just a couple weeks ago, maybe even last That's week, so I, yes, I, um, I read it. I talked about a story about bird songs and even said in the story, as it was listed, the majority of bird song is carried out by males to woo females. But it actually turns out that maybe that's all sexist BS. So basically, <laughs> it Wait, what? Out from a 2014 <laughs> study. A PhD in the biological sciences, uh, a woman, found out that about 70% of female birds sing. So already that's kind of thrown out the window. But also that both sexes almost certainly sang in the common ancestor of all bird species. So this kind of rocked ornithology at the time. But since then, the researcher who did that, Karen Odom, and... um, teamed up with Casey Haynes, who's a 
PhD candidate from 2019, who is a biological sciences PhD candidate, they work together to um, document what has been going on in this field with researchers. So women are more likely than men to be authors and even more likely to be first authors on papers about female bird song. So women specifically have reshaped this field of study. So this again reminds us that a diverse group of researchers is critical for scientific innovation. And diversity could also help, as we've discussed before, a more accurate and complete understanding of biology, of science, of everything. So uh, this is something that completely got rocked by a few female scientists and then just kept being found again, again, again. So these male scientists, it appears, were carrying a bias, assuming that males were singing for females. But once you kind of peeked in over the, over the, the, under the covers, I guess, of the, of the bird song situation. Under the hood. It's under the hood. It's under the beak. It's very different. So th there's, there's obviously a bias there. There's also an interest, you know, people research what they can relate to. And so perhaps this was also something that um, female researchers were interested in because male birds were historically researched before that because they were more interesting because they're prettier because they sing they more. They've got the plumage and of course, but you think they're singing more. Right. Yeah. And so it's just a reminder that um, representation is key in the sciences and that yeah. there's many voices in a lab doing research because there's an implicit bias no matter who you are, no matter what you're doing. And so if researchers all look exactly the same and have the same background and have the same upbringing and all this kind of stuff, it can impact research. Yeah, it can also impact the way that research is done because I mean, coming from a female run bird lab, we weren't studying song, but I was in the same building with one of the fathers of bird song um, and uh, his lab, he, he had at the time I was there, he had a female postdoc who was working with him. And, um, but everyone talked about the lineage and it's very, I love science for the, for the way that people track back their, uh, their lineage through from grad student to professor and back and back and back through time. And so it was, um, you know, this, this individual and then talking about, um, his, his mentor, the, the PI that he worked under who was, um, another man and you know it just it goes back and goes back and if if the people in charge of the labs who are running the labs are mm -hmm. thinking about things in a particular way even if they have women or you know a diverse representation they're not I it, it, the people who run the lab get to tell the people who work in the lab kind of what questions get to be asked mm -hmm. is what I want to say so the perspect those perspectives are important, and so the lineage may start somewhere with someone's idea, but through the generations of scientists, there can be evolution. Yes, and so, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a lot harder. Also, saying. if you're just talking about general diversity, it's a lot harder to increase diversity in a workforce if your entire um, team of VPs are all white men. <laughs> so, right. yes, it's a, it's definitely it affects things. And, yes. uh, and it affects the way people look at the world, whether we want to think that we're 100% impartial or not. And, and there's, there's something to the whole, like, uh, learning something very complicated. We're dealing with a large set of information. You start to need to make some assumptions. Mm -hmm. uh, you, don't, you don't go in as an engineer and challenge every law of physics as you go along to get to, to the point where you can comprehend how to build bridge or whatever you, you make assumptions that these things you're being taught are pretty set in stone uh, as you go along and fill in that information so that's also part of why it's then hard to break out of that because where do you start challenging uh knowledge that is has been taught and is assumed to have been well tried and tested uh it's yeah um the thing though that this whole conversation uh uh, made me think of is, yeah, the common ancestors to all birds probably sang since pretty much all birds sung 
or sing. Does that dinosaurs. mean dinosaurs? We're all like, dinosaurs we're going, like, sang. All singing all the time. Like T-Rex, as big and ferocious as a scavenger type predator as it uh, may have been, had the most lovely lilting song every no. morning. Do you know this so about T-Rexes? <laughs> the T-Rexes thought they had a pretty song, but oh. because they were very big animals, it was more of like a blah. But all the other dinosaurs were like, oh, that's pretty. We're clapping because you can't. But yeah, yes. that's good. It's a great song. You do a good job there. Yeah. I mean, croc crocodiles make very silly sounds for the giant scary creatures that they are. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I think now I want to, I want to know uh, why female birds would sing and why male birds would sing. And this, you know, if female birds are singing to get the attention of males, which species do this? And I mean, I think we're talking about this, but still, if you go out in nature, you're not going to be seeing female birds out on the tree limbs doing all of the singing. So in passerines, I, I want to know really what the split of birds who are doing this is. Right. Um, I'm not saying I don't believe it, but at the yeah. same time, I'm like, I believe it, but I'm going to guess it's in certain situations where oh, it sure. has evolved well, in a very particular way, where, say, for instance, the Western scrub jay does not have a lot of distinction between the male and the female body form. So, and they share in helping at the nest. And there's all sorts of things that are very similar. So why wouldn't they both sing? Yeah. If, if I may, yeah. we just talked about flamboyant cuttlefish last week. The females also can make brilliant displays. They're not trying to woo anyone, but they use them to communicate with the males who are wooing them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why so not have a conversation? Yeah, absolutely. I think you're pretty. Well, I think you're pretty. There I will go. accept this praise. <laughs> <laughs> you may come closer and I won't try to kill you. I'm not a black widow. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, this is a fascinating topic I want to learn more about. How about another topic that is really interesting? Water. Water. Where does oh. it come from? Where does water come from? Where have we discussed water on Earth coming from? Comets. Or, yeah. From space. Or maybe not. Huh? Or maybe not. Huh? What? Yeah. What? Huh? No, yes. it's from space, isn't it? Oh. This is what we think because we look at meteorites. We look at these little chunks of rock from space and look at how much water's in them and get an idea of like, okay, where could water have come from? And the reason that they thought it came from outside of the inner solar system, out past Jupiter, is because that's kind of out where fr things get frosty and mm -hmm. also where water could have stayed out there in ice form enabled been able to travel long distances and then landed on our planet after it was heated up and you know our planet went through a lot of transformation over the years it got hot it might have lost a lot of water but the likelihood that it started with water was really not cons considered because they were looking at these different kinds of meteorites the ones from outer part of the solar system uh yes they had a lot of water in them and they start these were these these chondrites they were called uh they started looking at what are they let me see if i can find it in this article here um yeah, so these chondrites, these chondrite uh, meteorites were being looked at, and they were finding those that had makeup very similar to the the Earth's. So it's like, okay, this stuff seems like the Earth, so it could have made up the Earth. And they thought these carbonaceous chondrites were the ones that carried water to us. However, they don't really have the same isotopic or molecular makeup as Earth, but they were from outside the snow line and could have held water. So, hey, let's think about those. But some researchers just published in Science about some new analyses of enstatite chondrites that they have looked at. These enstatite chondrites were formed in the inner solar system in the rocky area. And nobody was looking at them before because they were like, they're all rocky. They can't hold enough water to cover the earth in water. 
Well, apparently, looking at the water concentration in these enstatite chondrites and the deuterium to hydrogen ratios within these little meteorites, they match the Earth's interior. They match the rocks of Earth. And so what they are proposing is an alternative hypothesis that the Earth could have formed from these enstatite chondrite meteorites, that they could have had enough water to cover the whole planet. The only issue is maybe if the, uh, the enstatite chondrites, maybe if, they, uh, if there was vaporization, like I said, during the heating part of Earth's formation, then vaporization would have lost water. But then maybe it was brought back by, co- by those chondrite, the carbonaceous, carbonaceous chondrites later. Maybe comets brought some of it, but not all of it. And that's what the scientists in science propose. They said, why do you have to make up some complicated story like Jupiter had to move into the inner solar system and get all pushy and move meteorites (laughs) out of orbit and move comets out of orbit and then move back out and then that would lead to all this. Why do you have to make such a complex hypothesis? They said, this is much simpler. Earth formed from the rocks where it lives. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, in some makes... ways, it's, it's simpler. Yeah. yeah. It makes more sense. Yeah. In some ways, it's it's more complicated. Yeah. I don't know. So it's... Just, yes, you could have made the cake from uh, the ingredients in your cupboard, but did you see that cake? Because it would have been a lot easier to just buy it at the store. <laughs> could have been easier to get it from the store right so these are now dueling hypotheses but there is evidence now from actually looking at these meteorites that maybe there maybe it it isn't a cut and dried kind of explanation of water from the outer solar system riding on comets there's nothing cut and dry about water hmm (laughs) Ha, 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 ha. Dun, dun, dun. All right, Justin, how are insects the future? What's going on? Oh, we are, we are really moving along. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, let's see. Where is that? Oh, yeah. So this is uh, one of the ways in which global warming uh, uh, can be combated might come from this unlikely source. Insects. Turns out we could simply breed more of them. A lot more of them. Enough so that they could block out the sun. What? No. 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 Or or we could <laughs> or we could just use them for food. So agriculture is currently uh practice uh the current agriculture practices that we use are one of the major drivers of carbon uh emissions. Uh this is out of Indiana University slash Purdue University, Indianapolis, which is a university proving that you need not settle on a single name for a university. You can combine them if you like. Hyphenated university. Uh, scientists have found uh, new evidence that previously overlooked insect shows great promise is an alternative protein source. It is the yellow mealworm. Which doesn't sound like too far off of things that we've seen before. But we ate those in uh, Philadelphia. However well, long we, ate that was. we didn't eat the yellow mealworm. So this we is did? Uh, no, this is a different mealworm, <laughs> a different worm. Uh, but this one specifically, research is based on new analysis of the genome of the yellow mealworm species, Tenebrio molitor, and uh, this project was led by. Christine Picard, Associate Professor of Biology and Director in Forensic and Investigative Science. This is a program where she's no doubt asked daily to say, make it so. The work was published in the journal Insects and as Food and Feed, which is a very specific journal. It's, it's pretty much dedicated to eating bugs. Uh, this is Cody Voice from Picard. Human populations are continuing to increase and the stress on protein production is increasing at an unsustainable rate, not even considering climate change. Uh, the research was conducted in partnership with the uh, Beta Hatch Inc. Uh, has found the yellow mealworm, just uh, traditionally a pest bug, it's crop eater, can provide 
benefit in a wide range of agricultural applications. Not only can it be used as an alternative source of protein for animals, but its waste is also ideal as an organic fertilizer. Picard and her team sequenced the yellow mealworm's genome. Results uh, will now help those who wish to engage the DNA to optimize the yellow mealworm for mass production and consumption. Insect genomes are challenging, quote a voice from Picard. And the longer sequence of DNA you can generate, the better genome you can assemble. So some of the uses, uh, mealworms being insects are a part of the natural diet of many organisms. This is they can be yummy, product. very nutty flavored. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've had them in, I've had them I've had them in cookies. No, so these are the mealworms. I looked it up. They are the darkling beetle mealworms. They are the ones that we ate in Philadelphia. They're these the are? Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh. Yeah. We ate so these. Yeah, Great. so they're commonly roasted, but they're even more commonly crushed into flour. They flour. make a really um, oh. kind of nutty flavored but really protein rich flour that you can use in pretty much anything that needs flour. So one of the things that is being she's uh, sort of indicating is that we should really, uh, we could actually use these to feed the food that we eat. So fish, so if you have fisheries, you could be feeding them to the fish. Uh, pet food industry can use them as a protein source. Chickens, you can feed chickens with these mealworms. Oh yeah, we uh, feed mealworms to chickens at the zoo. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Wait, I fed mealworms to chickens, to chickens when I was a kid. In the family farm. What kind of what kind of side of the road? No, 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 no. It's part of the we family. Got a, we got a cyclops pig. It's a pig with one eye. Lost it. That's all. It's not really a cyclops. It's just a pig with one eye. Uh, yeah, and again, humans again. Also, I didn't realize this is the same one because this sounded like it was like the first time they discovered that we should be eating this. But I guess what the, this is saying is based on the genome. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an ideal source of protein i love the words though Not we will protein. optimize the mealworm for consumption it's going Mass to become production. no it's going to become like the next cow it's going to become the next chicken it's because we have optimized those animals not through genetic mm -hmm. modification of the genome you know but through selective breeding which was modification which is, of which, the, is which is which is modification yeah. of the genome through breeding <laughs> yeah. but now we have yeah. you know the big breasted chickens and mm -hmm. you know cattle that either produce mm -hmm. massive amounts of beef or lots of milk you know they are very specialized for what they do as food creatures and so i find it very interesting that we're starting to look at insects mm -hmm. in this same capacity so, so i not to not to like do a product placement that's not my intention here but i also have eaten on many occasions something called chirps chips which are made out of crickets. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they're, yeah, they taste great. I don't like crickets, but that's okay. So so what's also interesting, though, I think, is that you uh, even when you have the genome, uh, sometimes the best path forward is still uh, breeding. Uh, you know, uh, the biotech industry uses this a lot, where they have a couple of different strains of of uh, yeast or an E. coli or something. And they want to get they want to get these certain sort of robust gene combinations out of the, the different disparate ones. It's actually sometimes more difficult to splice them in and see what downstream effects you get than to take them and start breeding them in these massive breeding programs. Why so you can has, take Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was interrupting with my thoughts. Oh, the, the interrupt away. That's the real point. Why? Why have none of these insect companies started making an insect burger to compete with the lab-grown meat? That's a really good question. You could have you have your your steak burger, your turkey burger, your mealworm and cricket burger. Your I mean, why why aren't we doing that? I will say the one weird thing about eating mealworms or crickets is that if you have a shellfish allergy, oh. it is likely to be an issue. That so would be the stop. That is something that- Is that I with think, crickets as well, or is that yeah, just- Yeah, it's because yeah, exoskeletons it's the, have the same okay. kind of Chitinous proteins, proteins in them yes. as uh, as the exoskeletons in shrimp and crabs. That's why it's not in hamburgers. It well, it's not be. gonna be in hamburgers, but it could, I mean, why? But there still could be insect burgers. Yes. 
With a big disclaimer. Put it on the seafood aisle. (laughs) Yes. Confuse everyone. (laughs) Do you see the danger? Hey, Blair, tell me another story. Oh, I was saving this one for the animal corner. Oh, you're going to save it for the animal corner? Okay, then I have one more. One more for the quick stories. I need to tell you about how the roads kill. That's right. Mm -hmm. The... uh, Drivers in cars? Nope, not via oh. drivers in cars. The roads themselves. Because it's hot? <laughs> because when it's hot, they heat up and they release uh, pollutants into the air. They release organic compounds ah, yeah. and other things called secondary organic aerosols, major contributors of what are called PM2.5 Air pollutants comprised of air of particles that are smaller than 2.5 microns in diameter, which are pretty bad when they get into your lungs and can have significant effects on public health. Researchers published in Science Advances, these researchers are from Yale University in the lab of Drew Gent- Gentner, they looked at roads asphalt heated to different temperatures and determined that these products emit substantial pollutants into the atmosphere without any cars involved. It's just the heating. Paved surfaces and roofs make up about 45% and 20% of surfaces in the United States in cities, respectively. These, uh, These surfaces saw a jump in emissions up to 300% for road asphalt when it was exposed to moderate solar emi- solar radiation. So heating plus solar va- solar radiation is even worse. So, we should maybe start looking at different ways to create asphalt because hmm. Asphalt is not helping us any. Well, it is. It helps us get around. It's great if we can make it nicely and neatly but well, there is one thing is... that we can do without getting rid of cars right away, which right. is greening uh, roofs. So that was one of yes, the things that you were just that's talking a big part. about. 45% oh, of cities yeah, so are roofs, have asphalt. Um, they contribute to pollution like this, but they also contribute to urban heat islands. So yeah. because they, they heat up and release heat, it impacts the whole microclimate of an urban area. So greening roofs, planting on rooftops can have a huge yeah. impact on both of those things. Can I just say, I, I find uh, humans to be very inefficient when it comes to roofs. Uh, yes, agree. Two things. Two things. Three things. Especially three things. More stadium. things. More things. One, you're absolutely right. All roofs should be painted white to reflect heat in the in the warm areas. Yeah, absolutely. Or covered in greenery. Two, <laughs> two, they should also then have solar panels. Three, yeah, forget both of those. Why doesn't everybody have a deck on their roof that they can yeah. enjoy <laughs> with a little bit of a view? Mm-hmm. How come that's so rare? It's like the most obvious thing. You could put the deck on top of the... Anyway, people are just inefficient and uncreative at times. When it comes to their roof, it's like an oversight. Or people have inherited or purchased buildings that have been made in one way for a long time. And we need to change it. Yep. Yeah, it's that. But I think it's it's also because it's unseen. I think it's like when, when you see somebody whose hair looks great and then they walk by and the back is all messed up. It's because they just didn't <laughs> I see feel, it in the mirror. I, f- I feel <laughs> like I'm like I'm being attacked right now. <laughs> oh, no. I'm so sorry. No, no. That was... Was in general, that applies to all humans. You know, that's like anybody with curly hair at all. You like get the front all figured out, and the back is frizzy, just bump. You don't know, and you don't care, and nobody's going to tell you. Well, especially now where you're on uh, camera all day, every day. No one's looking at the back of your head anyway. It's fine. Nobody's looking at anything. Oh, this is this week in science. Go take a look at your roof. I hope that it's a nice roof. If you just tuned in. I hope that you are enjoying the show. We have a lot of science to come. If you are interested in a twist shirt or in a mug or in some kind of twist merchandise, head over to twist. Twist? What's my website? Yes, twist.org. T-W-S dot T-W. I can't speak. (laughs) Head over to twist. T-W-I-S dot O-R-G. And click on that Zazzle link 
to see what we have on offer and support the show. Okay, are you ready for a COVID update? Yes. Yes. All right. Let's talk about COVID-19. I don't have a huge COVID update. I know uh, Justin has a story coming up here. The United States is starting to come out of the uh, second resurgence, which is really still part of the first wave of COVID-19. Since May, our, or end, the end of May, our cases are starting to come down. Our deaths from COVID-19 are starting to uh, reduce on a daily basis. There is good news temporarily. Don't think this is a moment to rest. However, however everyone stay safe, continue practicing social distancing, wearing a mask, and being as safe as possible in social situations, because that will keep people safe. Moving into the fall. Now, the big story that's really interesting this week is about Brady Kynan. Brady who? No, not a Brady Brady who. Brady, Brady Kynan is a protein. That's right. Brady Kynan is a protein that is in a pathway that is regulated by something called RAS, the renin angiotensin system. And this is involved in blood pressure regulation and in fluid balance. And when a researcher at Oak Ridge National Laboratory was looking at the genes involved that are getting overexpressed in COVID-19 patients, he was looking through this and found that the genes related to RAS were way out of line. They were not doing what they normally do. And so he followed this trail and the study published in eLife suggests a new pathway that researchers can be looking at for treating COVID-19, suggesting that the RAS pathway and bradykinin are highly involved in the inflammation process that occurs. So the the RAS system, they followed this RAS, renin angiotensin system, was um, abnormal in the lung fluid samples, led to what's called the kinin cas cascade, which is an inflammatory pathway, and it's regulated by RAS. So RAS goes up or down, the kinin cascade goes up or down. This kinin uh, cascade is regulated by bradykinin. Bradykinin, if there's too much of it, causes blood vessels to leak. And when blood vessels leak, that means that fluid gets into the tissues where it's not supposed to be, and that leads to inflammation. So the fluid balance is off and inflammation takes place. Remember where uh, COVID-19 patient, patients tend to uh, s end up with a lot of fluid, Blair? In pneumonia. their lungs. Yes, in their lungs, and they end up with pneumonia. This is part of this whole system. So the bradykinin, it makes the blood vessels leaky, fluid leaks out into the lung tissues. And then there are other uh, proteins that are there that interact with that fluid and create something of a, like a jello-like material. It gels up. <laughs> like oh, a, no. Yeah. So the, so the, the fluid, it, it becomes like trying to breathe through jello, which is part of the problem for the oxygen transfer, it doesn't happen as easily because the fluid's there, there's too much of it, and it's thick. And so uh, they are thinking that this bradykinin cascade, this kinin system, the bradykinin involved, can uh, be a target. And other enzymes that are in there can be targets to, uh, to really fix the inflammation and potentially target the pneumonia and other symptoms that occur. Uh, it's pretty, it, it's very interesting as a hypothesis and researchers are definitely looking into it, especially because uh, the renin, renin, the renin, no, I can't speak tonight. The renin angiotensin system already has a lot of drugs that are uh, in use for things like heart disease and kidney function. The renin angiotensin system is already something that we have drugs that we're using that are already approved by the FDA that could potentially be repurposed. 
So this is a yeah. definitely a, an interesting direction that it could go. So we now have many targets. We've got the ACE2 receptor. We've also got the ACE protein that's involved. ACE is also involved in targeting bradykinin. So the uh, that is a target. The RAS kinin cascade, cascade get in there. Hopefully we can fix it. This is promising. And I want to say thank you to, I mean, we sometimes talk about data mining of these big, giant genetic studies where they're just looking at all sorts of genes to try and find something that looks out of whack. Well, every once in a while, this kind of data mining really does pull something valuable out of the data. And this is one of those situations, which is very exciting. So so I just have to ask, because I, I guess I'm maybe it doesn't even matter but we we were talking for so long about this being a respiratory disease and then there was that big story however long ago now time is meaningless where they were like no no no, no it's a blood disease so yes there that was a story yeah yes so would this, and this could be this would be that would this would explain that this would explain how it's a blood disease right how that part yeah. of it part of yeah. it for sure yeah it would explain how there is uh, the leaky blood vessels would also explain how there's potentially uh, influences on the brain that would explain why well, there wasn't is. Wasn't there like COVID foot was a thing too? And yes. that had to do with circulation? Yes, it has to do with circulation. This this would definitely explain huh. those kinds of symptoms. Yeah. Okay. We're, yeah. Just, we're just peeling away the onion on this thing. <laughs> there's so much going on. Wow. Yeah, I mean, but it's it's one of those things where at this point with medicine, it's wonderful. We're able to really dig in and we've got so many resources targeted at this field right now at finding out, you know, unpeeling the onion of COVID. You know, we've got everything targeting it right now. And it, it's amazing how much we are learning in such a short period of time. I don't think we have ever seen mm -hmm. this rapid <laughs> of an of amount of discovery on on diseases before. Yeah, that's a very fair point. And when we've had pandemics in the past, there's been a little bit of flying blind where you kind of try, you say, okay, so based on this evidence, I'm going to try this thing. But if we really can figure out exactly what is causing symptoms that can help us treat symptoms, but it could also help us kind of attack the thing at, a, at the source in a way that maybe we couldn't have before. Yeah. Hey, Justin, did you have a COVID-19 story that you wanted to talk about? I just got a quick blurby thing. Yeah. This is a meta-analysis, which is also a thing that we haven't really had access to in, in, in many past diseases throughout all of human history. <laughs> um, where they they looked at uh, this is uh, they looked at uh, seven different randomized trials that included seventeen hundred and three patients of uh, whom six hundred and forty seven died. Well, that's about a third of them died. This is also uh, these are very severe cases, patients who weren't doing well to begin with. Uh, they they uh, this was. They did 28-day all-cause mortality, was lower amongst patients who received uh, corticosteroids compared to those who received usual care of placebo or some other treatments. So basically, it's, uh, if, uh, the idea is there's effective therapies for patients uh, with coronavirus uh, who have according to this, uh, have demonstrated that low-dose dexamethasone reduced mortality in hospitalized patients. Dexamethasone. Uh, who, yes, who required, uh, with COVID-19, who required respiratory support. Uh, the interesting thing about this study, too, is, is just that it's a metadata uh, study. This is one of these things that we've sort of talked about, like, why isn't there more of this? How come we can't... He, how come we can't just look at the raw data throughout all these millions of cases that are going on to, to suss out what is and what isn't happening, what is, what isn't working, uh, that sort of thing. Anyway, here's one example. And it's it, the, the, that, what did you call it? How do you say pronounce the drug? 
Dexamethasone. Dexamethasone. Yeah, it's a ster- it's a steroid. It, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's one that is uh, rather common, used for all sorts of mm-hmm. different uh, applications and treating patients. Um, so it's something that we have not to, we not do not need to guess side effect. Uh, we do not have to guess health implications. It's well documented already and is showing an efficacy at that late stage uh, for the most severe patients. Um, one thing that also there was, this is sort of a side piece to this, is, is I've been reading uh, accounts of uh, people who are have recovered from COVID-19. You don't want this. Yeah, uh, you really don't want this when 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 people's uh, when you're seeing those numbers of people who have recovered, that is not like getting over a regular flu and then just going about your day. I'm back. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> it's it's uh, well, apparently the you know, the some of the testimonials that I was listening to or reading the rock, up on, the rock himself, yeah. the oh, rock his said family. his whole family, he said. He had it, he recovered, but this is not something you want to mess with, that it really gave him trouble. So it gave <laughs> trouble. If, but, but if what something hearing, gives the rock trouble, yeah. I don't want it. <laughs> but, what I, but what I was reading about was persistent, like months later. Like these are yeah. these, uh, some of these the accounts long haulers. got in January and February. That's what they were yeah. calling them, long yeah. haulers. My uh, still, my son's piano teacher has that has one, oh, has one of those. Who, who yeah. are still reporting... Burning lung sensations, yep. uh, ongoing fever, fatigue, hair mm-hmm. loss, Ooh. Uh, all sorts of all sorts yeah. of uh, continuing. You know, we're five months, four or five months past when they first encountered, and are still having daily sort of struggles with the aftermath of having encountered this virus. So it's not, you know, when when people are talking, looking at those recovered numbers and thinking, ah they're fine now that's that's not a that's not accurate yeah it's it's not accurate and there are uh, studies that suggest that even those people who show mild symptoms or are asymptomatic may still have uh, have damage to their hearts and the if hearts, that or, or yes the, their lungs, lungs and their hearts was like the first thing that, that they were and reporting if, from survivors of Wuhan. Yeah, and if that is something that is ongoing then that means that there is potential for ongoing uh, people having ongoing health issues as a result, cardiovascular issues as a result of of this virus. Yeah. Gaurav Sharma says, why is the COVID reinfection data so sparse? It's a fantastic question. Uh, either because my guess is pure speculation. We still need to, I still don't understand why we don't have reliable information on this. Uh, which which makes me suspect that it doesn't really happen at any. The reason yeah. the data is so sparse is because it must be either not happening or a very rare event. Yeah, um, that's what that's what. Or it's uh, the tests were not. The, mm-hmm. Sometimes people show yes. proteins for a few months after, so it could just be that the proteins are still in their system. Or, or it could or, be or, that, you know, your reinfection needs to take three, like it takes three months to be able to get reinfected. And we weren't really testing people super well, it's kind of to the point where maybe now we might be able to get some reinfection data, but up until now, my, it might've been pretty yeah. hard to get. My best I think it's guess, really though, not that bad. My best guess is that those cases where they are showing reinfection probably didn't actually have COVID the first time because the testing initially was so unreliable that you might have a regular flu, go get tested, it came back as COVID. So you quarantined, you did all that stuff, and then you went back out, and then you actually got COVID later. And maybe with them, maybe the testing is improved, or maybe not. Now it tests that you do have it. Uh, fine. There were because there were people who also like tested multiple times, and it said that they didn't have it. And then they got a test that they said they did, and they went, "Aha, I do have it." Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they could be long haulers too. It could be someone that's still infected from earlier. You know, could be a re- a reinfection even once this starts to. You know, if we got yeah. that, that kind of data, it would be pretty hard to tell. Um, unless you were testing them consistently, you have it, you have it, you have it, you don't. Okay, yeah. now you have it again. 
Yeah, so I'm I'm a little suspicious about reinfections being a thing yet. Uh, I feel like we should have known that for a long time uh, already. Like that should have kept happening in in especially in places with the you know Italy, uh, France, California, New York, Florida, Texas, Arizona hot spots. Uh, we should have seen a lot of evidence and I'm hearing very sparse one-offs here and there yeah. of that possibly occurring. Yeah. So and a lot of these not folks, happening. Yeah. And a lot of these, like, when you look at that it, much. they had initially caught the COVID uh, when the testing was at its worst. So that's and, why I'm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's also possible that if you didn't have a bad case of it, it's like, yeah. You didn't create a lot of antibodies against it, and so you could mm. get it again. And mm -hmm. uh, there are many possibilities, mm -hmm. but yeah. But I, yeah, I think you're right, Justin. It's sparse because it's rare. Oh my goodness. This is This Week in Science, everyone. I keep clicking the wrong buttons <laughs> and clicking all over the place. Do you want to help Twist grow? Get a friend to subscribe today, please. That would be great. And do you know what time it is right now? What time is it? It's time. We are switching things up a bit this episode. It's time for Blair's Animal Corner. She loves our creature, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a What you got, Blair? Oh, I have a story about anemones. And Anem they're frogs. I love saying that. Anemone. With fronds like these, who needs anemones? Um, no, uh, it's about their arms, actually. So um, this is a study looking at uh, what determines how many arms an anemone has. So anemones, they're cnidarians. They're related to jellies, to jellyfish. You can kind of picture them as a sessile. It means they don't move. Um, upside down jellyfish pretty much. So they have arms just like a jellyfish does. It's how they catch their food. And uh, they all seem to have a very different number of these arms. So uh, in us, in mammals, our genetics tell us how many arms or legs we might have. We don't have any external kind of um, external variables for the most part that can alter that in development. <laughs> Um, but anemones are different. So uh, until now, we haven't really known how many arms or tentacles the anemone can grow. Um, but now this study coming from the Gibson lab at the Stowers Institute for Medical Research in Kansas City has shown that the number of tentacles is defined by the amount of food they consume. So, quote, controlling the number of tentacle arms by food intake makes the sea anemone behave more like a plant developing new branches than an animal growing a new limb. Um, so, reminder, they are animals. They're invertebrates, just like jellyfish, like I said. So, they are not plants. They are animals. But they, they do, in fact, seem to grow more arms if they are, if they are fed more. So this, this happens not only when they're a juvenile, but also throughout their life, which is helpful because if you lose an arm, uh, for example, if a fish tries to eat one of your little tentacles, you can grow one back. And so it might actually be pretty handy if you could activate that by eating more food to replace your damaged limbs. I lost my arm. I'm just going to have a burrito. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Wow. So sea anemones show us that it's not that it is possible that nutrients are not converted into excess fat storage. They can actually transform them into a new body structure. Yeah. It's pretty wouldn't think, it be nice to be an anemone? Yeah. I case. think it's I think it's amazing. I mean, we know that there are limb regenerative abilities for so many animals. 
but humans have a hard time with it. Although we grow our fingernails, our noses never stop growing. You know, our hey, ears what? never stop growing. What? If we our break a bone, my nose is big enough as it is. Oh, it's geez. gonna keep going, man. <laughs> our, our ears keep growing, right? Our bones, our skin repair themselves. You know, there are regenerative aspects. Our 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 livers love to regenerate. If we lose a chunk of liver, it'll just grow right back. It's really great. But why can't we and how could we make this regeneration possible? So it's fascinating to see in an what we think of as an animal, a simple mm-hmm. animal still. Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- it's, this isn't a plant. Even though it's acting like one, it's not a plant. Mm-hmm. And it's just regenerating limbs. And those tentacles yeah, are complicated cool. structures. They're covered in knee day which is why they're called cnidarians. It's the little fish hooks, little stinging cells that they have that allows them to sting fish that get too close. And try to so they've got them. multiple cell types that are involved. It's not just, I'm just going to take this one skin cell and just mm-hmm. keep growing skin. Yeah. yeah, Pretty complicated structure with muscles and these stinging cells. Yeah, so... It's Someday, I just want to eat that burrito. and. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, like, I oh, wonder no. that. I, I hurt mean... my leg. Cut it off. I'll have a big meal. It'll be fine. So, <laughs> no. obviously, obviously. Don't have a cow or maybe do. So. Yeah. Obviously, a small sacrifice to make to regrow a limb. Uh, but I suppose you'd have to give up, like, coffee and alcohol. Sort of as if you were pregnant while you were regenerating. Probably. Oh, perhaps, yeah. Maybe. Okay. You'd have to. You'd have to sort of go on like the same sort of uh, nutrient-rich uh, diet that a, a, a pregnant person, um, well, pre- I'll say pregnant woman, might uh, might have to go through. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, it would be a very interesting study know. to take this, take a bunch of anemones, and then um, chop off a couple tentacles. And then pour alcohol or something else or other pollutants <laughs> into different containers and see if it affects their tentacle growth. You are both cruel and curious. I like it. Indeed. <laughs> As researchers <laughs> sometimes must be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a great lead into my next story. <laughs> oh, oh, geez. Let's and get I, it. It's about ensuring better science through better care for lab mice, which is a topic we talk about all the time. I think it's going to be a the big deal in the future. Because it makes nothing but sense. A happy, healthy test subject will perform more reliably. So this is looking at uh, mental stimulation in mice and their environments that they are held in leading up to experimentation and during experimentation. So this is a study from the German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases, DZNE, in Dresden. And they looked at the behavioral differences from um, different mice in different uh, kind of living arrangements. So they designed a sprawling cage that made up of 70 interconnected cages arranged on seven levels. So they had quite a little mansion for these mice. This was considered an enriched environment. So it had equipment designed to inspire play. It had plastic toys. It had tunnels. It had hideouts. And they replaced and rearranged this stuff every week. And so that's something actually that when you look at animals in zoos or aquariums, they're expected to be enriched many times a week because that's supposed to be part of good mental health for animals in captivity. So um, they enriched all these animals. They had this huge amazing play structure slash mansion. And then, so they, what they did is to be very scientific, they took inbred twins so that they had no genetic vari- variation. This is going to come into play in a second. They wanted no genetic variation in their cohorts. So they took five week old mice. They housed 40 of these individuals in enriched environments for six months and 40 of them in standard cages for six months. And then 40 spent three months in enriched cages and then moved to standard cages. So they have three different cohorts. So one is all enriched, all bored, or enriched for a while and then bored, basically. And then they were microchipped to record their movements. And then later they studied their brains, which brains, which did in fact mean they had to euthanize them to get to the brains. Thank you, lab mice, for your service. Um, Lab mice that spent the entire six months in the enriched environment were more likely to explore as adults. There was a great range of individual personalities. 
And so they started to develop kind of their own way of moving around space and, and responding to test behaviors. In the, in the context of mice, when we talk about individual personalities, that's relatively stable differences in behavior. So basically it, it got to the point where you could kind of predict what this particular mouse would do. That would be part of their personality. Then they found that the mice that spent either three or six months in the enriched setting had more neurons in their hippocampus, which is the part of the brain associated with memories, learning, and emotion. The group that went from enriched to standard settings continue to show high rates of exploration, even though some of their activities are diminished, they still seem pretty interested in their environment. And they also found that the mice that had been kept in enriched environments had major changes to their genomes. Mm -hmm. Their genome changed from the space they were living in. Wow. Yeah, so their, their behavioral How? differences became what imprinted changed? on their genomes, and it remained them even when they went back into their standard cages. Um, so this is long-lasting differences in their brains. Um, they had methyl groups attached to particular regions of the DNA in the neurons of the hippocampus, and that alters the genome um, and it uh, it alters how it's Expression. read and indicated mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, so it 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 changes the proteins that are made basically. Yeah, um, it, the methyl groups kind of wrap it up, and or they they yeah. Yeah, they so ch they change it's definitely like an impactful change in their genome. Um, and so on one side, this is really good news potentially for people who have had traumatic events in adulthood, but whose childhood was otherwise stable, because it appears to show that when they're developing or where you spend the majority of your life can have an impact on your genome. But they think that because the mice that went from an enriched environment to their stable environment, they called it, continued to have this genetic change throughout the study. It was a short study, but still it appeared to be unaffected. So one single event kind of is what they're implying here is not enough to mess up your genome forever. Um, and that good, providing a good environment early on can have a permanent impact. So they didn't study old vice, mice versus new mice in these enriched in, in, habits, but um, the, the implication is that where you grow up is pretty important, which I'm sure we all know. Um, but I think it's more interesting because this does impact behavioral studies. If you're using mice in behavioral studies and they're being kept in a really boring, boring drawer in a lab, that could impact your study. So I've told this story before, uh, but I was a long, long time ago in high school. I took a summer sort of internship job at the orthopedics research lab at UC Davis and uh, was headed by Neil Sharkey, who was the head of that department, who went on to be head of R&D at Penn State and I think has since retired. Uh, but he, I had gotten this desk next to a bunch of mouse cages and they were experimenting with this new needle. They would cut the jugular vein of the, of the, in the neck of the, the mouse and suture it up under this really intense microscope. Uh, and the survival rate was about 18% in these mice. And they just sort of hung out at the bottom of their cage. This was, they were post-surgery mice that were stationed next to me. And their food was in the little uh, in pellets at the very top of the cage. And they, they, you know, these recovering mice never seemed to go up to it. So I was sitting next to them innocently enough would feed them parts of my lunch. And I just sort of put it into the cage. <laughs> they could get that, uh, you know, a little bit of cracker, a little bit of tuna sandwich or whatever I was having that day. And they sort bad of they're Justin, like, then they got just Justin. enough. To, I didn't know what I was doing. All right? You're not just supposed like, oh, to feed them just, snacks. <laughs> well, but after that, 100% survived <laughs> because they were able to get uh, nutrients that they needed without climbing to the top of the cage. Uh, and they sort of recovered and were managed to get up to the top of the cage then and eat the pellets. And they, it, was a, it was just such a dramatic turnaround. Turns out, though, uh, the experiment wasn't about survival rate or anything like this. It was just practicing with this needle. Oh. So 100% of the mice were destroyed anyway, yes. and I didn't ruin uh, somebody's experiment. Yeah. Um, 
But it did prove to me that, yeah, absolutely. Uh, how how, how you, you interact keep the and, animals yeah. Yeah. makes a huge difference uh, yeah. to the outcome of the animals. Yeah. And just to, to um, piggyback on that, there was another story that came out this week from Newcastle University, just showing that how you handle the mice can have a huge impact on their mood and um, how they respond to different stimuli. So they, they transported some by picking them up by the tail, which stresses them out. And they transported some by tunnel handling. So basically they they encourage them to go into something like a paper towel tube and put a hand on either end and then take it to the next thing. Something just very simple like that. And so that one does not stress them out. And the difference is that um, the anxious, depressed mice, the ones who are being picked up by the tail all the time, are more disappointed when something bad happens, but their low mood has no effect on how elated they are when something good happens. But um, so basically it does impact their behavior it impacts their mood and so we should be tunnel handling mice which makes perfect sense it might take a little longer but it is totally worth it because it won't impact them negatively and i'm seeing a lot of questions in the chat about laboratory animal euthanasia and all this kind of stuff and uh there's some speculation going on and i will say as far as i know the grand majority of lab rodents are euthanized via carbon dioxide gas, which is because it's a natural gas that's already in their body. It doesn't impact research. And so, and they just go to sleep. And then everything that has to happen it, uh, happens after that. I will also say that some labs donate their animals that were not used in chemical trials, that were used in behavioral trials to mm -hmm. uh, zoos and wildlife centers um, to provide food. So they recycle, which is cool. <laughs> um, but there yeah, are, anyway. there are many ways. Yeah, the but I something that I think is really we know we've talked for years about how animals are kept, and we've talked about mm -hmm. enrichment, and I you know, we've talked about. I mean, it was years ago that the hippocampus was shown to have neurogenesis in response to uh, to environmental enrichment. So I think this next step is fascinating because it digs even deeper into what's actually happening at the level of the neuron, what's happening in the cells. And so if the at the D level of DNA, you have these epigenetic changes. Mm -hmm. I, I, these are mice, but like you said, Blair, the implication that changing one's situation in the laboratory or in life can have uh, long-lasting effects after that mm -hmm. situation. So... Which is important These in the pandemic, important. because if you have been spending since March inside and not enriching yourself, that could have long lasting impacts on you. So or go outside, it, take a walk. Or, or also get a it, giant it wheel change. and put it in your living room. Or, the, the, yes, it can change. The, so it's the not plasticity, set in stone. It's not set in stone. It means that if you feel like your 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 neurons are going, I can't handle this and you're you're not you're mentally not happy after the pandemic is over. It's you're not going to stay unhappy forever. This will change, yes. and your brain is plastic, and it will come back. And these these little tags that that get tagged in your neurons. I, I think this is. I think the positive side of it is change can happen, and that's yeah, very exciting. Yeah, and that self care is a happen? real thing. You have to enrich yourself. Enrichment is great. Yeah. I just, I'm really enjoying the fact also that during your story about mice in the laboratory, my cat has been very, very attentive during this story. <laughs> yeah. Who is the mice? She's, she has been keeping me enriched for sure. Is that your last Animal Corner story? Mm -hmm. All right. Everyone, thank you for listening to This Week in Science. Thank you for supporting us as well. You are the reason that we're able to do what we do. You're the reason we can continue bringing scientific information to everyone on a weekly basis. And we can do even more with your help. So if you are not already supporting us, please head over to twist.org, T-W-I-S.org, and click on our Patreon link. Become a patron of Twist. Select your level of support Anything $10 and more, we will thank you by name at the end of the show. There are many levels, many rewards, but regardless, 
any amount helps us do what we do. So thank you. We cannot do this without you. Thank you for supporting Twiss. All right, we're coming back. Justin, do you want to so, tell some stories? I've got one left. Uh, our gut microbiota has been shown over the... Uh, we've talked about this quite a bit on the show. It can influence our behavior. It can influence neurodevelopment. Uh, the intestinal microbiome composition has been linked to everything from depression, anxiety, autism, as well as neurodegenerative disorders, including Parkinson's, Alzheimer's uh, disease, uh, through metabolites produced by bacteria living in our gut. But what about our four-legged friends? And I don't mean cats, because they're not our friends. So it's what? just dogs. Just it's just dogs. Do they have? Do dogs have similar responses in their intestinal makeup? Surely not. Uh, since dogs can drink out of puddles, they eat anything, poop. Like they can do that, and they don't really seem to get sick. Uh, or maybe, maybe more so because of all the weird things that dogs will eat and drink. Well, I know uh, that our our microbiome is more similar to our own dogs than dogs' microbiomes are to each other. I think. Right? Isn't that a thing? So, okay, good question. Uh, I know that there is overlap between, there's going to be overlap between uh, a dog and their owner. Um, I don't know if that makes them more similar to the human than to a, uh, than they would be to another dog, but there is, there is an area of overlap in shared microbiome. Uh, the longer you are living with your dog, the closer your micro, microbiomes sort of get closer to each other, but I don't know that it would make it. Because um, you lick each other. I mean, you like yes. each other. Yes. But oh, I have oh. a feeling uh, the, the dog carnivore gut from another dog is more similar to the, from dog to dog than it would still be from one uh, dog to owner. Um, but that, that, that's it. So this is a, a new research though out of the uh, anthology department to uh, the faculty of science at Yotovsloran University. Uh, indicates that dogs' aging mechanism and memory performance are linked with their gut microbiome composition. So this is this is sort of interesting. They used service dogs uh, for this because these are dogs that they can track over a long period of time. They have a wide range of lifespans, inclination to develop dementia, and environment shared with humans. So these companion dogs promising model for the organism uh, for the uh, for the aging research to, to be done and it turns out it's uh, pretty similar uh, next generation DNA sequencing technologies have enabled the identification of the taxonomic taxonomic composition and also the potential functions of the microorganisms gaining a better understanding of microbial host interactions says Thomas Fielold. Uh, Assistant Professor of the Department of Microbiology, ELTE, Budapest, who usually studies the microbiome, uh, microbial communities in natural waters. So, uh, sort of going into the microbiome now. Overall, uh, what was sort of interesting is they saw two things. One was one was very similar. One was very similar. They they saw there's a link in a particular uh, gut microbe that is associated with Alzheimer's that also goes up in dogs as they age and as they start to do more poorly at uh, sort of cognitive dog tests, the uh, it goes up in dogs as it does in humans. This is a, uh, but there's also, but also there's, there's some that, uh, that do the opposite. There's, there they have, they have things that head the other. Okay, so they, they found a negative correlation between the abundance of Fusobacteria phylum and the chronicle, chronological age in dogs. Interestingly, in humans, Fusobacteria were shown to increase with aging, and elevated abundance of these microbes have been linked to serious illnesses like inflammatory bowel disease, colorectal cancer. So finding that the opposite is taking place in dogs uh, was sort of an interesting find. 
<laughs> the, my favorite part of this though is the is the this is Sarah Sander, who's a geneticist and apparently a Ziploc bag aficionado, uh, who explains some of how they performed their science. After we tested the memory performance of the dogs at the Department of Ethnology, we took them for a walk and collected fecal samples. We had to immediately freeze the excrement in storage containers to ensure they would provide a valid picture about the bacteria that lived in the dog's guts before defecation. The time limit is important as some species of bacteria can continue proliferation after defecation and therefore may falsely outnumber other bacteria in the sample. So they had to grab it and probably put it on ice, rush it into the freezer and stop things from growing really, really quickly, which is not easy unless you get really good at it. Get the system done. <laughs> Running all over the place, putting things in freezers. This is fascinating. I I think it's uh, even the what it it's it's fascinating that it's similar between humans and dogs. That this these species go the, up and down. The actinobacteria. The, the actinobacteria yeah. was the one that uh, that increases in both humans and in dogs and seems to yeah. affect short term memory. It's one that's actually linked to Alzheimer's. Yeah. Uh, but the Fusiobacteria was the one that went the other direction. It's the one that when when it goes uh, up in humans, we start to have uh, all these bowel problems and stuff. And it seems like as dogs age, it actually goes down. Goes down. So it may be it may be a protective bacteria yeah. in that case. So it shows that uh, the universality of a gut microbiome uh, may not be there. That they may played very different roles uh, depending on the species uh, that they inhabit mm -hmm. and, and have different affects. So. Which would make sense, although we would we do like to think of, you know, it's like they're mammals, they're animals like this. Wouldn't it happen similarly? Can't we just assume it's all going to work the same? Not necessarily. No. Not necessarily. Um, Justin, did you mention the sample size of this study? Uh, no, it's 29 dogs. So wow. that's one of the things that um, I because I was looking at this story, too. I think it's really interesting, but it is a really preliminary study because it's only 29 dogs. So it's a very interesting look. I think um, it definitely means we have to look closer at dogs, especially since their microbiome is closer to us than pig microbiome or mice microbiomes are to ours. So studying the dog microbiome definitely has a lot to tell us about our own, definitely mm -hmm. more than other common test subjects in laboratory mm -hmm. and cl clinical trials and things. Um, so I think more studies are needed, but yeah, definitely 29 dogs is a, is a, it's a, it's a, Modest sample size. Yeah. Um, yeah. The other thing too is this is uh, I'm now taking just uh, Dr. Justin's dog poo pills. Not a real doctor. Maybe not poo from a dog. Pills off the market uh, temporarily until we get further research uh, done on this. Uh, because I it won't didn't ship occur you Sadie's then, like well, we discussed well, before. I'll hold on off on that shipment. Well, it never occurred to me until d doing this study that there could be an interest in getting uh, gut microbes from animals. Like a dog can drink out of a puddle and never get sick. Mm -hmm. I want a dog's. Uh, I want a dog's microbiome so I can drink out of a puddle and never get sick. Like, like, like people can write. Like, I never thought of that. Like, people could actually start requesting other species gut microbiome to populate. That might not be good. Although, although you know, maybe there's a way not to be uh, gluten intolerant with the right microbiome. Maybe there's a right. way to finally digest uh, red peppers for me. Or maybe it's uh, maybe you if you're if you want to eat a lot of bamboo, you can go get a panda microbiome and stuff. So I just pictured. Um, are you guys familiar with the show Wild Kratts? Taking yes. kind of kind of a dark turn. Oh, jeez. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm hmm. Wild scats. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I I think the other aspect of it is yeah, if the if we're seeing these shifts in the microbes of the gut bacteria of dogs and they're going up or down with the same kind of uh, memory changes, maybe we can look at that and see how we can adjust our own microbiome better to avoid deterioration of memory. Yes. That yes. Would be great. And you know, poor old dogs with dementia. That's always sad. Let's it fix is. that. <laughs> Let's uh, fix how much that. you want to bet? Oh, I have more stories. Oh, I, I was going to say, I'm out of stories. But how much do you want to bet that the uh, that, that we have probiotics for dogs? Uh, oh, before humans? Before we have a really comprehensive one <laughs> yeah. for humans. Your dementia in dogs. Humans, mm-hmm. not yet. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, it's the supplement market that it might yes. get out there, but in mm-hmm. terms of yeah. FDA approval, that's going to take a little bit more time. And yeah. Yeah. Do Who's regulating this FDA? stuff anyway? I have some stories about what I've got. What do we talk? Okay. Let's talk about brains because we've been talking brains! about. We were talking about microbiome and aging in brains and mouse brains and now i want to talk about your brain on music your brain on music yes when your brain is on music and you want to snap along to the beat you're not just hearing the beat you are also incorporating that understanding of the beat into your neural system and then having an, a synchronized waveform of the activation of the brain that your brain in a way is going to have to get synchronized with that beat and then if you want to produce some kind of a snap or a tap that goes along with the rhythm then you have to produce a synchronized output that matches the original rhythm it's really a lot more complicated than it seems So researchers wanted to investigate this, and they looked into, uh, they were looking into some auditory rhythms. They had a simple auditory rhythm, they had a medium auditory rhythm, and then they also had a more complex auditory rhythm. The simple one was just one-to-one, so the beat was just And it was just at a a, a very basic, uh, easy-to-follow tempo, frequency. And the uh, the researchers had volunteers who were all experienced musicians. There were no musical novices in this group of uh, of volunteers for the study. Had them uh, listen to these beats and then tap to the beat with either a one-to-one a one to two or a th- or a one to one to one, a two to one or a three to two uh, beat rhythm. So let's see. This is the first. There we go. This is the first rhythm rhythm they listen to. Seem pretty simple, right? Sounds like sounds like what a dripping sink sounds like when you're trying to sleep. Oh, why but if you, is it so loud? But you're thinking I can keep up with this beat. One, 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 one to one rhythm. Pretty easy, right? You can do that. And then the more moderate rhythm. Keeping up with one out of the two of those beats is a little harder because you're dropping a beat there, right? It's a little bit harder. Okay, and then the more complex rhythm. Hold on, here it comes. It's a little bit 
chat room is really sure that we're about to get rickrolled here. <laughs> <laughs> There's no rickrolling going on here. This that paper was published now. in the Journal of <clears throat> Cognitive Neurosciences, and the researchers did actually identify markers in the brain that determine differences in the musician's ability to uh, to do different aspects of this task. And they found that the brains had an easier time synchronizing with the simpler rhythm than they did with the more complex rhythm. And that there was variation between individuals on how well they were able to synchronize with the rhythm and also how easily their motor output synchronized then with the uh, with what was what they originally listened to, uh, but they found that the brains of these individuals. Let me get this thing up here on the screen. They found that the brains of these individuals. Why did it do that? They look like donuts. There. They look like donuts, mm. but they found that as the rhythm became more complex, yes, more of the brain was incorporated into, synchroni into, into synchronizing with the rhythm, not just listening to it, but actually uh, figuring out the rhythm to be able to have a motor output. And, um, and their ability to synchronize with the stimulus influenced their ability to synchronize a tap in time to the stimulus that they listened to. Hmm. Which kind of, you know, it makes sense. Your brain timing up with things is going to going to fit in there. Oh, absolutely. And so, have so, output that matches matches the input. Yeah. The the better than coffee for me to get my mind awake and active and get my whole body and mind moving and, and functioning. Swing music. Yeah, <laughs> there's this uh, electro swing station I've been listening to. That's it's swing, but it's also like uh, sort of modernized and uh, redone. Uh, those beats, for whatever reason, uh, get my mind turned on and active better than <laughs> anything else. And it makes yeah. total sense. I, there's some sort of synchronizing. My neurons are like, oh, a lot of stuff is going on right now. Let's jump in. <laughs> yeah. They, they also found that the uh, the ability to hear the music, so just the auditory re uh, auditory aspect of just listening, that had absolutely nothing to do with their brain's ability to synchronize with the music and to basically understand the rhythm. No, you got to dance. You, <laughs> you got to start dancing. Yeah. So the listening... It's it, the, the stuff comes in and then your brain does something with it and then it has an output and it's whatever your brain does with it. And some some people, their musicians are either better at synchronizing or worse. Does that make them better musicians? I don't know. I think it <laughs> I depends on sure. what kind of musician. So so right. my personal experience, because I played um the baritone saxophone is I was often in charge of the bass line and I, my favorite bands were always the jazz bands that I played in. And so I was in charge of this very like steady beat in the background when other people were flip flopping all over the place, having their fun. And so <laughs> I think that that was something, yeah, that I had to be very careful. And I think I was pretty good at keeping that beat on and maintaining that while everybody else was doing their crazy thing. Maybe the drummer was having a drum solo, not on, not maintaining a beat almost mm -hmm. at all. Just, yeah. So that was definitely, I think it, de it takes different types of people to do different parts of music. And, and that's something that's really important if you're in charge of a bass line or you're a drummer. What aspect of it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but they, it, they did say what this, this quote from the researchers I find really interesting. We were surprised that even highly trained musicians, that's highly trained, that doesn't necessarily mean they're good. Even highly trained musicians sometimes showed reduced ability to synchronize with complex rhythms. And this was reflected in their EEGs. Most musicians are good synchronizers. Nonetheless, this signal was sensitive enough, sensitive enough to distinguish the good from the better, or super synchronizers, as we sometimes call them. So apparently there are some individuals mm. 
like super tasters, like super smellers. Mm -hmm. Their brains are super synchronizing to a beat. Uh, which this all just reminds me of some uh, thing I ran into on the YouTubes. Uh, of course. It, 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 everybody should go look for it because uh, it's pretty amazing. But there's this eight-year-old girl who uh, has been playing along to uh, David Grohl's drumming of Foo Fighter mm -hmm. fame. And they've been going back and forth. Uh, he issued some sort of challenge. She played this song perfectly, sent it to... And he's like challenging her back with this other more complicated drum, but she's like incredible. Like this eight year old girl is tearing up drums. Like no one you have ever seen do this uh, before. Uh, really incredible. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, those are two super synchronizable peoples. Uh, is that a thing? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Superly, superlatively synchronizable. Superlatively synchronized, but it's just amazing <laughs> to watch drumming at that level, where we're like, boom, stoom, boom stoom. but this is like all kinds of other things going on, and in a physical environment where you actually have to hit things to make those beats. Pretty intense. It's very intense. So another brain story that happened this week last Friday: Elon Musk uh, announced uh, had another press conference for his oh, Neuralink dear. technology. Oh. Yeah, and the I Neuralink... I don't know this one. I haven't followed this one. This is one of his companies, and uh, it they are trying to develop brain implant technology mm -hmm. that will sometimes, someday be used to treat uh, brain disorders. But more recently, he's really doubling down on the creating a human ability to integrate with computers so that we don't get overrun by AI. Because if AI is going to be super smart, then we need to become super smart as well. And how do we do that? Aren't we just with handing the, the AI the keys then? I feel like exactly. <laughs> I feel like that is exactly what's happening. Like when you are, when you are identifying uh, your friends and family for Facebook, you're feeding uh, face recogn facial recognition. You're just doing the work for improving facial recognition when you do those those sorts of things. When you identify things in those uh, crypto picturey what you McCollums to get into a, a website. what do they call the, the when you the visual ones are like which where's the street sign or which one of these is a boat? Guess, you're, is that a captcha? Captchas, so thank you. Captures. Yeah, you're you're absolutely training artificial intelligence every time you do that. So yeah, letting the AI into the brain. Yeah. No, thank you. Come on in, computers. Come in. Oh it's gosh, okay. Yes. <laughs> but are we really getting there this week? This, on Friday, what he announced is uh, his his device. Uh, last year, he announced a robot that was going to eventually do brain surgery to put a brain implant behind your ear. Uh, but now they've kind of changed their plan and they are talking more about developing an interface technology where uh, the, a, the robot would implant a little plug into the top of your skull and the plug would contain about a thousand electrodes, little tiny, tiny, tiny wires, someday hopefully up to 10,000 electrodes that would then interface with neurons in your brain to collect signals from your brain that could then be re read by this device, which uh, is Bluetooth enabled. And the Bluetooth enabling would uh, allow the device to then talk to computers. The computer could then potentially do things. Um, he showed in the press conference the device uh, being used as it's currently implanted in a pig named Gertrude. The pig um, has an implant, and whenever her snout is touched, there's an array of electrical activity from neurons being activated in the brain that go bloop, 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 bloop. And so it showed a very musical display of uh, neuronal activation. Is this an advancement on anything that we currently have? The answer so far is no. We already have brain implants. And in fact, there was a story from just in April this year of a flexible neural interface that was uh, published in Science Translational Magazine, uh, Sci Science Translational Medicine, that has over a thousand... Im electrodes in this device that would potentially would 
would outlast and outwork the implant that Musk is uh, is talking about. So this device uh, is not that Musk is selling at this point has not yet been approved for human use. He's gotten breakthrough technology uh, ability uh, from the FDA so he can start looking at it in people. But so far, it's just been animal trials. They're looking at human stuff in the future. Is it a big deal? So far, the, the, the verdict is no. That doesn't mean it won't be because he is recruiting very intelligent, uh, enabled engineers to be able to develop this technology further. Will it become the thing that lets us be equals with the AI? That is definitely yet to be seen. So uh, Elon Musk uh, started this app that can transfer money. We already have checks, debit cards. He started a car company. We already have cars. We even have a couple of electric cars. Why do we need that? He started rocket coming. We have rockets. We have a space shuttle. Why would we need your thing for anything? Yeah, uh, he seems to do a much better job at prioritizing uh, the researchers and the developers of technology to to go and do those those big things, and ignores sort of the oh well, how's the cheapest way we can produce this product based on the minimum specification that the somebody wants to buy for it. He's a, he's, he overshoots and, and, and so has been incredibly successful, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, that this is in its early stage. Yeah. yeah. And overshooting is fine. We need visionaries. We also need people who w are, as we're seeing in COVID-19, this pandemic, when resources are put behind things, progress mm -hmm. happens faster mm -hmm. and it's not taking a shortcut it is fast tracking because we're putting more resources behind it and so in the same way people like musk are able to rally financial resources rally the brain power resources that are required to make change happen to get somewhere in a different way um, i'm not saying that he was the first to invent a tunneling machine or the first to invent, yeah, a car or a rocket. But he's doing things in a different way. Um, and it, it's interesting. And we'll see, I, I think because of people like him, we will see progress happen technologically that has not happened for for a few decades. I think it, I think this kind of forward movement, someone hitting the gas, it's important. It pushes our it pushes the envelope a bit and you can like him or not like him. Oh yeah. And he's not making astronomers happy right now. I know that. <laughs> oh. That's for That's well, for sure. What's, what's his, that? I don't Oh, with his uh Robert Hagland in the in the chat room on YouTube is saying he's not making astronomers happy. His space company is uh has been launching the uh the satellites uh uh, what Starlink? It's Starlink satellites into orbit, and they they're very shiny, mm. and they are going to be all over the place, thousands of them. And he's not the only one who's going to do it. There are other companies who are going to be launching these small communication satellites into orbit, and their orbital trajectories will put them very way, very much in the way of uh, astronomical observations from ground based mm. telescopes. Man, I was just reminded of our um, interview about space trash, thinking about that cloud of trash around that. the planet, yeah. and now adding it's... all these satellites. Oh my! That's how I'm like. Oh, we're getting a. Li we're gonna have a ring like Saturn. No, <laughs> no, we're not. We're gonna have like a cloud of gnats. <laughs> yeah, we're we're gonna have to worry less about uh, climate change because of the sun being blocked out by all the satellites. Like Justin was talking about the bugs. No, it was. It's actually gonna be all the garbage. Satellite. We're getting a few. Yeah, there's a few in the chat room unhappy with Elon stories in there. Yeah, I actually, honestly, I, I think I, I think outside of uh, being a, a driver of industry and technology, I think the man is a complete idiot. <laughs> it's I really let's, do. Let's I let's, really do. Once again, let's separate the art from the <laughs> artist. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And recognize that there's some his, really great stuff happening. That like comments, you were saying, 
He, his comments he puts and his actions resources in, in the good things overall. The, yeah, comments and actions in the midst of the pandemic uh, yeah. were terrible, awful. Oh, they were awful. Yeah, they, um, yeah. No, some probably of them, cost great. them lives. Not good. Yeah. No, yeah. for sure. Uh, many of his comments about uh, many things in public, I just idiot. Just somebody. It's like uh, I get that you. This is what happens. The billionaires get surrounded by people who yeah. agree with them mm -hmm. because they work for them and never really want to cross them up. And I on, think there's also it's not, it's not that, it's not that it's not that it's not that. Also, I think it's also that they have a completely different way of looking at prioritizing things for the world because they're look not looking at the world as someone who's just, I have to get a job and I have to pay the bills and I have to do the thing. He, Musk and some of these other, like they're pushing, the people that are pushing society forward because of their financial, their financial capabilities Musk is someone who he has a vision for humanity and everything is secondary to his vision for humanity. I believe if, a, you know, if a few people, you know, get hurt or if there's a, you know, there's um, there are injuries along the uh, along the way, losses along the way. That's fine because the end goal of humanity making it to some other goal of us going to Mars, of us having energy reserves, of us beating the AI, you know, if those larger goals for humanity are met, everything's fine. So he, I think he's looking at things from a very different perspective. It's not that he has yes men around him all the time. And I think he so, does not surround so, himself by yes men. I, but he I, is definitely, and he's provocative on social media on purpose. Yeah. Okay. But we could talk about this after the show because I still need to talk about space and dark oh, energy. Let's, let's go. Because we're not done with that story about dark energy. <laughs> There's a lot of it. Dark energy, right? Uh -huh. A lot of dark energy in the universe. It's pulling us apart. Dark energy, it's causing things to sp spread out all over. You know, dark matter is the clumping. Dark energy is the expansion of the universe, which is accelerating. It's like someday we're going to all be spread so far apart from other galaxies and other places in space. We won't be able to see them or detect them in any way. <sighs> Where is the dark energy? How do we find it? It's dark. What is it? There has been a hypothesis for decades that not all big old stars form black holes, or at least not black holes in the way that they are described by physics, that there is an alternative kind of black hole. It's called a geode, generic object of dark energy. Cool. Yes. Does it have crystals inside still? No, it has dark energy inside. And that when big old stars collapse, they don't just form a black hole. They don't break Einstein's equations. There's no singularity. What happens is you get a spinning outer layer around a core of dark energy. And it's dark, so we can't see it. And it acts just like a black hole, except it's not. It's, it's the black hole's dark cousin that we don't talk about. Anyway, the black hole, and there's been some evidence in gravitational wave detection that some of the mergers of black holes that we're seeing, they're, they're bigger than they should be. And so one of the explanations is that they're not really black holes that are merging, but they're actually these geodes that are merging and that they're mergers of dark energy. But this is, that's another side story to all of this. Researchers at the University of Hawaii in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, they've been working on this idea of geodes. And last year, they showed that geodes could, in principle, provide the necessary dark energy that's in our universe to explain dark energy in our universe. If they moved by black, like black holes, say one of the researchers, Kevin Croker, staying close to visible matter, galaxies like our own Milky Way would have been disrupted. And obviously our galaxy hasn't been disrupted, so they're someplace else. And so they've just published in the Astrophysical Journal a new study 
looking at the dynamics of these geodes and their spinning. And they put the spinning of these geodes into a computer simulation and determined how they moved relative to each other. And they found that if the outer layers spin slowly, the geodes love to clump and they actually clump more than black holes. They're super clumpy. But if they spin super fast near the speed of light, then they avoid each other. They're like tops that don't want to be near each other. They're like, boom, let's go to the other edges of the galaxy. And they repel each other. What this means, they solved a bunch of equations and looked at energy and mass distribution in the universe. And pretty much the dark spaces in the clumpiness of our universe are probably filled with geodes. And that Mm -hmm. would explain everything. They think that the uh, distribution of matter uh, and dark energy in our universe is explained by the fact that these geodes are there. They're these big collapsed old stars that ended up being dark energy spinning around really, really fast and repelling themselves and everything else. And that instead of hanging out with places like the Milky Way and our black hole, they're like, I got to get out of here. And they're leading to, they are leading to the expansion of our universe. Hmm. I think we need to get somebody on to talk about this because it's so fascinating and I don't get it and I can't hear Blair, but I think her head hurts. I just said, I don't get it. I think I'm going to have to listen to this podcast again because I didn't. (laughs) I was like, I had to find the source material in the show notes and I was trying to follow along. I don't get it. I, I, I would love to hear from someone to talk more about this. Yeah. I mean, I think we need to call this University of of Hawaii researcher. I mean, if it wasn't for COVID, I'd say, let's go down there. <laughs> let's, let's go, go to Hawaii. I'm grabbing the axe handle. You get the pitchfork. We're going to get to the bottom of this. Yeah. What's That's this new right. new bangle theory on how the universe is working? Uh, open the door. Knock it down. We must go in. This is and then go hang questions. out at the beach for a while. I don't know. <laughs> and then maybe look at well, a volcano. here might as well. This is not a big deal. Yeah. We're taking you out yeah. for coffee and some explanations to your yeah. theories. Yeah. I mean, it could be wrong. We don't know. But it is another explanation. It fits with a lot of data. And it's bringing together some disparate as- some disparate ideas in astrophysics. So uh, it's definitely, definitely interesting to look into and to learn more about. But it's a new idea that's out there. Well, it's been around for a while, but the new, newly researched again idea, which is very exciting. Black holes, not black holes sometimes, but sometimes dark energy. This is what? Yeah, I need to learn more about this. Well, you know, if, if dark energy is this underpinning force kind of like uh, dark matter, it can be everywhere and anywhere. It can be being influential in black holes. It could be in the suns. Like, until we know where and what and can identify, it's like you can put it all sorts of places to identify the, I mean, I'm, I'm without knowledge completely. Uh, just saying you could find a way to make it a sort of God of the gap insert of like, well, what if dark energy works this way and then answers all of these questions? It would have to mm. look like this. And so there it is. I don't know that that's what's happening though, because right? I don't know that we have, but I don't know that we have any observations. Otherwise that could actually inform a reality other than theory. Just because the thing can work. For Does, instance, yeah. the, the very first, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, globe that could track the stars, the, the, that could track the stars and everything, had the, the, the uh, Earth as the center of the universe. And so it had Mars moving across and then moving back. And it had the stars moving in all these weird patterns around the thing. And it worked and it could predict when you would see Mars or when Venus would arise. It actually worked. But it was it had to go through these really extreme sort of 
models of you know stars uh, uh, planets moving in weird directions for it to work uh and then you know once the earth became we uh, became it became when we became a heliocentric solar system then you could just make a model where a thing went around and everything worked also and that's how it actually is even though you might be able to predict where something now, is doesn't mean you understand it. And now we have to put our little planet in orbit around a sun, in orbit around the in the Milky Way around a giant black hole, in orbit with other things in our super cluster. I mean, it's there's so much. Yeah. We Everything are is spinning. Spinning in our atoms too. Everything's we're trying spinning. to and we're trying to explain it all. <laughs> Very well, being dizzy. so dizzy, exactly. Even, even so the dizzy. geodes are spinning. Everything is spinning. Yeah, well, we've come to like the a end whirlpool. of the... Like it a never whirl, ends. whirlpool Sorry. that brings us into the drain after you've plugged it at the end of a bath. So right. goes the end of our show. So goes the end of our show. I have a question from Jason Olds. Oh. Jason Olds writes in, I am a longtime listener and Patreon member to Twist. When you started your new segment with listener questions, it made me think about what I may have a question about. I started to think about small things first, viruses, bacteria, amoeba, fungus, parasites. Then I came across enzymes. I went on YouTube and watched a quick video that was way over my head. I realized I know 0% about enzymes. Do you mind giving some basics on them and why they exist in our world? Well, Jason, let me tell you about enzymes. Enzymes exist to speed things up. Enzymes are what we call catalasts. Catalyst, not catalasts. Catalyst. They are <laughs> not a catalyst. Enzymes are what the we call of proteins. catalysts. Yeah. Catalysts. Yes, or what I like to call, they're like biology's power up. You can suddenly do things you couldn't do before. In fact, there have been enzymes discovered uh, that speed up biological chemical reactions so much that they allow life to happen. In fact, back in 2008, there was an enzyme that was discovered, an enzyme that uh, is called uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase. Let me try this over again. Uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase. I cannot speak tonight. I can't wait to do the Patreon names at the end. This Decarboxylase, enzymes end with an A's in our terminology in biology, uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase. It changes the rate at which chlorophyll and hemoglobin can be, cre can be created. And if that enzyme were not there, it would take it's like 7 billion years for hemoglobin to be created. <laughs> We would not have the molecule that can carry oxygen because it would have taken half, like half of the, uh, yeah, it would take a really long time. Anyway, yes, chemical reactions take a very long time and sometimes, and the energy, it's called, there's this energy level that you need to get over this hump, this threshold that needs to be gotten over to allow the reaction to take place. And so enzymes are this wonderful metabolic tool that cells, I mean, sometimes it's just a chemical, but sometimes they are molecules that connect together to allow the energy to be accessed more quickly. It's like a, a quick elevator lift. It's like, whoop, there you go, you made it to the top, now you can go down. Or they reduce the energy of activation so it's not as hard to get into the uh, into the reaction in the first place. Enzymes, They're the proteins in your body doing all of the work. Yeah. yeah. They do all the work. Without enzymes, yeah. we would not be able to do anything. They are targets for drugs, uh, targets for many, many drugs, because when you adjust how enzymes work, you adjust the rate of reactions. And so you can, you know, you can affect diseases from even happening or not. 
Enzymes. I hope I answered yeah. your question. You need enzymes to um, consume dairy. I always think about that. <laughs> I do. Lactase. That you need. So yes. thank you, lactase, yeah. for allowing me to eat cheese and ice cream. <laughs> you have you have salivary enzymes that pre-digest your food for you so that it's not as hard to chew and not as hard to digest when it gets in your tummy. Yes. Good job. Yes. Good, yes. Good job. Good job, enzymes. Thank you for digesting uh, my food for me, enzymes. And and uh, one way to to visualize what an enzyme does in terms of work, in terms of being a catalyst, what that means as a catalyst is you can you can think of an enzyme as uh, vinegar to a your your bowl of uh, 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 what you might call it uh, baking soda, right? Mm -hmm. Got the big bowl of baking soda, just sits there, nothing happening. The enzyme is your vinegar, you pour it in, suddenly everything is exploding. All this energy has been released. Released. Uh, and all this chemical reaction is taking place at a really rapid pace. It's basically what, what an enzyme is doing. It's, it's unlocking the energy and transforming those molecules. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we use it for everything. Is... Laundry detergent. All laundry detergent. Laundry detergents are enzymes. Yeah. They're all enzymes. That's very important. Yeah. Enzymes are responsible for so many things. They are just, they are essential. Tenderize your meat. Clean your dishes. Allow you to live. That's right. That is right. Okay. <sighs> We have come to the end of the show, and I just do want to say at the end of this show how much we are going to miss Ed moving forward. I found the earliest email I have from Ed in my Gmail. Oh, That's wow. not even going back to my other old email accounts. Edward Dyer sent me an email. He was sending me, he started sending me uh, twist stories for the show, and he sent them in emails, and he said... You've probably seen this story, which gets my vote for one of the best science headlines of the year. Parasite causes zombie ants to die in an ideal spot. Mm. Hollywood could, could be kept busy for years just making movies about parasites that exist in the real world. You could do an entire podcast on parasites. So could someone who does political shows. <laughs> Smiley face, Ed. Yeah. That story was from August 13th, 2009. We're going to miss you, Ed, very much. And yeah, if you are listening to the show and you know Ed, uh, we are going to organize a Science Island gathering to be able to get together at some point soon so we can talk, share memories, and just you know, be together and remember. So uh, stay in touch, keep in touch, get in touch if you're interested in that. But I will be reaching out. Thank you all for listening. Shout outs to Fada for helping in the show notes and for helping with social media, making that happen. It's amazing. I really appreciate your help. Gord, thank you for manning the chat room. Your, your assistance there is essential and identity for totally essential. Thank you for recording the show. Mm. And I would like to thank our Patreon sponsors and the Burroughs Welcome Fund for their generous support. Thank you to Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Scioli, Eric Combs, Flying Out, Guillaume, John Lee, Ben Rothig, Ali Coffin, Maddie Perrin, Gaurav Sharma, Josiah Zayner, Mike Shoemaker, Sarah Forfar, Donald Mundus, Rodney Lewis, Stephen Alberon, John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Darrell Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Corinne Benton, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Ben Bignall, Kevin Reardon, Noodles Jack, Sarah Chavis, Paul, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Joshua Fury, Sean and Nina Lamb, Sue Doster, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflo, Jean Tellier, Steve Leisman, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard Brandon Minish, Melizond, Johnny Gridley, Christopher Port 
Richard Porter, Christopher Dreyer, Mark Mazzaros, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Robert, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Matt Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapeau, Alex Wilson, Dave Neighbor, Coasty Ranke, Matthew Litwin, Eric Knapp, EO, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, Patrick Pecoraro, Gary S., Ed Dyer, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, and Jason Roberts. Thank you all for your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at This Week in Science. Click the Patreon link. On next week's show! We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific Time, broadcasting from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org backslash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us just only with your ears? We're a podcast. Just search for This Week in Science, wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, hey, get a friend or a family member or an enemy or a coworker to subscribe to. <clears throat> for more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, which is www.twis.org, which is O-R-G. And you can also sign up for our newsletter, which is apparently a thing that we have now. Yeah. Hey, uh, you got something to say to us? You can contact <laughs> us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just put twist, T-W-I-S, in that subject line, or what'll happen? It'll turn into a geode of dark energy <laughs> in space. It's been really fast. <laughs> Create a giant black hole where yeah. you can also hit us up on the Twitter we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you tonight, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world. Jeopardy. 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 And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our method instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. God the eye. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way you better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then
then please just remember it's all in your head. Cause it's this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science
it is you don't have that thing where you said something in a meeting and somebody pulled you aside and went, you know, yeah, that's yeah. not really <laughs> subject <laughs> for uh, work that you should let out of your face hole. Like, <laughs> you know. Yeah, uh, okay. So here. Here, here it is. Here's the study. People with disagreeable personalities, selfish, combative, and manipulative, do not have an advantage in pursuing power at work. But I was wrong. It doesn't mean that they don't have a disadvantage, that they, that they have a disadvantage. It's they just don't have an advantage. So selfish, deceitful, and aggressive individuals were no more likely to attain power than were generous, trustworthy, and nice individuals. Why not? Disagreeable individuals were intimidating, which would have elevated their power, but they also had poorer interpersonal relationships at work, which offset any possible power advantage their behavior might have provided. So it, I guess it balances out. Yeah, Carol and Renoit pointing out right. more psychopaths in upper management. I believe this. I believe like, that too. It, you know, I, I, uh, it, it depends on the industry too. I, I, I honestly don't know that... You know, uh, all industries are going to be the same in terms of yep. what approach to upward mobility is going to work best for the individual. I think, yeah. I think that's that's probably true. I think it's very true in uh, in anything that requires collaborations as the basis for work to be done. I think that those aggressive, deceitful people probably will. Uh, be less likely to be invited to the next group. Uh, yeah. Uh, then, then there's the, then but, there's but the it, that if the, on the psychopath side of things there, then maybe there are the people who are going to be nice long enough to gain power. And then they're like, ha, ha, I am here and I will, or the, or the power gets to their head and they, be, they, they release their inner psychopath once they become powerful. Okay. Who no, I don't know. Interesting. Yes, Gaurav, no, CEO is number one job choice for sociopaths. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> what do you want to be? I want to be a CEO in charge of everyone. I want to be CEO of the world. I don't. I really, really don't. Well, as uh, oh, is... Thunder Beaver. Oh, I'm sorry. You got to do your job right. Check okay. everything. Sometimes people don't like to hear the truth. Shubru got booted from a board meeting for not being a yes man. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Identity Four does want to be president. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I I have the I have a tendency to. Be candid, as some listeners of this show may have noticed from time to time, and say the thing that is in my head comes out of the mouth. And and uh, some places that has uh, been appreciated, and in some work environments that was not the right choice career-wise. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, was there a... Did uh, Matajuro send you a poem? I don't have a poem and so I know Matajuro was working on a poem last week, um, but I don't have anything in my email. So I maybe Matajuro just sent it to you. I do have it somewhere. You is do it, is have it, it being? Uh, Would uh, we did not share? So no, uh, Matajuro was asking if you had shared it, but we no, have I, I have not. Uh, I figured we uh, could do it at a get together. We could, you could do it yourself at the get together. I wouldn't uh, mind doing it yeah. myself, but it's. Uh, yeah, I think that yeah. would be great. Unless you want us to read it right now. Uh, Carol says, uh, "Candid." You don't say. I tend to be sarcastic, and so. <laughs> this, uh, yeah, I that maybe how you ended up in uh, Scandinavia, Carol. I find I find the Scandinavian senses of humor or just conversation to be that to be couched in a dry sarcasm uh that does seem to i i really appreciate it, it absolutely uh fits with the way that i interact with the world um 
I like dry sarcasm. It does seem to sort of be a a, a stigmatized. It's it's although strange. I really like puns, so that could keep me out of Denmark. <laughs> no, <it's, laughs> so, but it is this is something I have noticed in a workplace because I have a uh, a bit of a sarcastic affect sometimes in my speaking. You some occasionally. Uh, what? It's it's yeah, but I will encounter people who don't have that uh, the ear for it. And so the sarcastic thing that might be said uh, can be taken literally and responded to like like you this is it was an intentional comment and it's addressed in that way and then it's like awkward because you have to back to oh I was I was sort of kidding when I said that. but or just let it go and like, oh yeah no you're right that thing that I said doesn't make sense now that you pointed out the obvious that missed the wordplay completely yeah you're right. Hmm. Anyway, uh, so uh, what's this get together? When are we gonna? When are we going to? Yeah. Um, do you? I mean, do we, should we wait until next week and uh, give time so we can tell people on Facebook and kind of have people put it on a calendar? I like think so. Next, next Friday or something. Next, like, would that be? It would be that Friday would morning, Friday morning for you. Yeah, yeah, that would work. Absolutely. Okay. Let me check. Get the Science Island crowd back together. Yeah. That was the last time we all really talked to him. So. Next week. Yeah, that would be perfect. Next Friday. Would some, uh, I don't know what Blair's up to. She's not here to discuss a time, but I'm yeah. guessing she's not going to be doing much exciting. But if we did something like 6.30, like we did last time. Ooh. Okay. Oh, no. How early would that be for you? I apologize. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think three. So it'd be Saturday. It would be it would be Saturday morning for you, right? It would be Saturday morning at three thirty. <laughs> yeah. Morning to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. What time would be good? <laughs> uh, Guar Sharma may ask, "How did you learn about Ed?" Well, Ed Ed was one of the early people to reach out to the show as a listener. He was, I think, even uh, caught the show somehow through some RSS. From the when it was just a radio show, uh, I think he's been listening that long, which would put it at over fifteen years. Yeah, um, I need to go back and find. And uh, Ed was, uh, I think, a caller then, um, mm -hmm. and emailer of story ideas, things like this, and then. Uh, the after show, uh, a lot of times we would, we would, we would be in the chat rooms and what have you, it would be uh, a lot of conversations there. And then we did, uh, he started a thing called Science with a Twist, which was for listeners of the show to have conversations and like a, a Google Hangout outside of the show and sort of do a spinoff uh, of the show with people who listen to the show talking about sciencey things. Uh, and I joined in on that uh, a number of times, and and the it wasn't always just science. We would talk about all sorts of things. We would talk about politics. We would talk about uh, what was just going on in our lives. It just turned into these conversations. Some of those science island uh, hangouts or science with a twist hangouts would go four hours long, uh, or yeah, you know, uh, with different people sort of jumping in and out. Um, uh, listeners, uh, listeners to the show, uh, so hanging out, just hanging out, having conversations, and and Ed is one of the those people who you regret not having spent, or I regret not having spent more time talking with, even even yeah. through the, all those four hour conversations and such that we'd had in the past. It's uh, uh, did you talk Definitely with him on his? On his did you do his political conversations also? Oh, the, oh yes. The big oh, political yes. conversations too. Oh yeah. yes, 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 yes. Uh, we talked about everything under the sun. Uh, yeah. 
on those on those shows. Nothing was nothing was off limits. Uh, uh, it was news of the day. He would bring in. He would sort of have a list of stories, uh, science or otherwise, that he would he would sort of put out there to sometimes four or five of us. Uh, that would start the conversation and and go from there. Um, so yeah, uh, wonderful guy. Always curious, always open minded, and uh, yeah. yeah, definitely uh, feeling that loss. Uh, yeah. the planet the planet's a little bit dimmer without them. Yep, totally agreed. Uh, how did we find out about his uh, passing? Um, I I only heard at the uh, in the after show last week, so uh, no, was that a, was I I didn't mention in the after after show. After show. Sorry, the, the after, after after show. Once we were off the air, it's the first. Yeah, I I I see these names in our chat room mm -hmm. on a regular basis, and Ed was was missing. For a week, and he he, he occasionally is in it. He he had he had been kind of complaining about his internet or his computer off and on for a, a couple of months, and I was like, oh, okay, maybe it's just his internet, or maybe he took a day off. But he had in the past taken off time, taken breaks from Facebook and the internet. But he always told us, and then he missed another week in the chat room here, what during the live show, and I I kind of kind of went, ah, where is he? And so. A couple of days after that, I got on Facebook and started looking and realized his last post had been August 4th. And so I asked on his Facebook page where he was, and some people got back, and someone said that he had passed. Um, and so it's still, it still hasn't been officially announced on his Facebook page. I don't know exactly how it would happen, but he has a wonderful... He has a wonderful, has wonderful connections with people all over the world in different, you know, in, related to science and other interests of his, these face, these Facebook pages and groups that he started. And so there's, yeah. And he, he hadn't mentioned, yeah, he had mentioned he wasn't doing well. I didn't, nobody realized that it was so serious. Yeah. So. <clears throat> yeah. Just letting you know that I notice, <laughs> even if I don't reply to each one of your comments, I, I don't, you know, I don't read the whole chat while I'm doing the show, but I do notice mm -hmm. the names that are in there, and I notice who's been with us for a really long time, and I notice the people that I connect with on Facebook and other places, and yeah, so all y'all in my chat rooms, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> I see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all in this world together. Let's make it better for each other. Ed certainly did. I hope, I hope that we can all have half as much enthusiasm and energy and excitement for learning new things. Yeah. Learn more. Let's learn more things, huh? Let's be curious. Yeah. Let's keep that curiosity going. And uh, keep the conversations taking place. Um, that's, yeah. that's what drives this show. That's what the show is. It's it's all it's a conversation. All the science news stories, they're just starters. <laughs> they're just uh, just just a way to start looking at that world. That's all around us all the time. Yeah. Taking this, taking this little time out each week to have that conversation is absolutely uh, why is why I'm why we're doing the show. This is it. Yeah, that's it. Talking and Identity about. Four says we're like a big, a great big family. When it hurts yes. when we lose one of our own. Yeah, yeah. we are like a great big family. A wonderful, wacky, spread out science family. Yes. Science Island in our hearts. And it's, uh, I wish I could uh, re uh, talk to Ed right now uh, because we talked a lot about Science Island. 
Like what would be required? Like what would we actually need to do to create this sort of, you know, off grid community, like what people would have to have what skills and how we would organize it. We talked a lot about this. Yes. Like and I, this. I got the visit science Island, uh, in reality, uh, uh what is it called? Swan home. I think is what it's called. It's this sort of collective here in Denmark. And they've got a, they've got a couple of, wind turbines up big ones they got solar panels they have it's like 400 acres 130 people they have chickens and goats and cow dairy cows and they're making almost all of their own produce and they have clean water and it's but it was just a phenomenal setup of this this old farm uh that got taken over back in the 70s and turned into a collective and we're, you know, what, uh, 40, 50 years further down the road and the thing is going strong. Hmm. And it was just really amazing to get the tour of this thing, uh, over, over this past week, uh, which is absolutely something I would love to share with Ed because we've talked so much about that, uh, how, how to organize something like this and here are these people, they, I mean, it's to the point where they have like their own, they separate their trash out into uh, different materials that they can then use and bring in and recycle. They've got like the metal shop and the wood shop and they've got, all, they've got borrow cars. They have cars that the collective has bought that you can uh, check out if you need to drive somewhere uh, as well as bicycles. There's a bike shop there to repair bicycles. They have a communal kitchen um, that uh, so nobody's, nobody's, paying rent or paying for food, they take your income and much of it just kind of goes to the collective. But uh, then you go in there, you just, they have people who are preparing meals all the time. So you don't have to do the cooking. You have to volunteer on rotation to do some of the work. And they all sort of help out at doing stuff. There's a preschool kindergarten on site. There's, uh, it's just, it's just, they've got the, they've got the actualized version of much of what we had talked about over the years at this place. Very cool. Yeah, maybe there'll be more of these things working and popping up. Yeah, I think we'll if see, I love the I love the idea though of having a place that's also uh, the other the other side of it is it's not just it's a working farm that's uh that's uh, y using that's that's sustainably run, that has, you know, creates its own energy and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Not just that, but also that it's like a teaching facility and you have lectures and you bring scientists in and you have people who are experts. And and so the whole thing is it's educational as well yeah. as active in practice. And I think which that this is place the, does. the big Which this place does it. as well. And has yeah. music festivals, which is another thing we talked about. Like, how oh, do you still yes, generate income that too. for the thing? Is you yes. bring in music festivals, you bring in the public, you give them mm -hmm. tours, you have cafes yeah, that's you based all on things. all the organic food that you're growing. Mm -hmm. you, you do a full, this place is doing all of those uh, points that we hit on and, and discussing uh, Science Island. Uh, the only yeah. thing it's missing, there's no lab. Well, you need a lab. Science Island needs a science lab. It needs oh, to be yeah. doing some research on top of all the rest of this. <laughs> I love it. Yep. Yes. An innovation lab. Research oh, and innovation. Barb Sharma, are you in Alameda? I yeah. like Alameda. I like a, I like, I like a uh, town too. that has a has a, a cave entrance, a back yeah. cave entrance to the town, and uh, the downtown with the old uh, movie theater marquee. If that's still there, it looks like classic what 50s 60s americana and it's a little downtown alameda is a pretty pretty sweet spot <laughs> and oh and it's a hundred percent renewable energy for alameda right now wow yeah. geothermal hydroelectric sources wind it's power great. and landfill gas oh interesting that makes me very happy after just seeing an article in the guardian talking about how um uh, energy companies are not expanding their alternative energy sources, solar, wind, hydrothermal, geothermal. They're not expanding those as rapidly as they have been expanding coal and uh, and gas energy. And so, so 
So yeah. even though we're making progress, it's still not as much progress, but we need to get those energy companies to buy in. Make uh, it go. No, An island is one place. It's like, oh, you have this little thing here and you can do, 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 do and yeah, we'll do that. But so, we need big. So, so buy in. some energy companies have bought in. Uh, for instance, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric in California is yes, probably some. one of the more greener grids. But but what you have to understand is most big energy companies that are fossil fuel oriented aren't energy companies. They're mining okay. and logistics companies. They have nothing. Yeah. They don't care what the final product is. This is just they're already invested in the mining and logistics. Of why not moving. give it? Why don't they move it out to the people? Yeah, system. anything else yeah. is competition to them in that business. So. But, but, you know, one of the things the, on the political front, when people are talking, the criticism against the Green New Deal is like, they want to get rid of your cars and get rid of hamburgers and make you live by candlelight. No, actually, the goal is so that you can leave the lights on all night long, eat as many burgers as you want, it might be yep. made out of mealworms, but still, <laughs> use how many crickets. hamburgers you want, and that your car <laughs> will be an electric car that'll go further and faster, and you might not even have to drive it yourself. Right, like, like the actual vision is to be able to leave the lights on as long as you like and not have an electric bill on top of it and not to be admitting uh, uh, carbon at the same time. It's to do more uh, than we can do with fossil fuel. It's not to do the idea. The goal isn't to do less than we're doing now. It's to do more. And you do that with alternative energy sources. You don't do it with fossil fuel. That's a Limited resource with a major downside and an expense that can end in wars and pollution and disease. <laughs> no. So there's, there's alternatives that are better uh, and don't have to sacrifice anything. Awesome. You still have, you might even get straws back, regular straws back. If you... So have you ever heard of photo switches? The uh, light switches, switches, well, are, the switches of, yeah. that are triggered by light. So this, yeah. uh, there were so many stories I didn't talk about tonight. Linkoping, uh -huh. Linkoping University. It's got the umlaut Linkoping. I don't know how to say that. I don't. Uh -huh. I don't know. To, I don't know how to umlaut. Uh, <laughs> have created a new molecule that they say can trap energy from sunlight and then preserve it for later use. So it's like a two-part molecule where it's in one form to trap the energy, to like grab the energy in and then trap it and hold on to it. So it absorbs it and then uh, doesn't release it. So it has a parent form that can absorb the energy from sunlight and an alternative form in which the structure of the parent form has become changed and more energy rich while remaining stable. This makes it possible to store the energy in sunlight in the molecule efficiently and they're calling them that's part of a group of molecules called molecular photo switches hmm. yeah i hadn't heard of these before but it's um yeah a really interesting use of this yeah of how of using changing the form of a molecule to have it to have to do have two uses So one of the issues with solar energy, right, is how do you store it? But what if you can what if you can store it in the absorptive devices, in the solar panels, for trickle out or energy release later, which would be cool. Anyway, I hadn't heard of them before. I think it would be part of Carol Ann. I think it would be kind of like the part. Good night, Eric Knapp. It would be, it could be part of an artificial leaf. But it wouldn't, it would, it would be like, uh, it would be like a photo, a photo diode and battery in one where it would, it would hold, absorb that energy and hold on to it until it's, uh, activated or tasked so so what's sort of interesting to and uh oh, who is bringing this up in the the other chat room uh where will the power for electric charging this is from hot rod all the solar would require a ton of solar cells but where would 
Oh, yes, yes. Tons of solar cells, wind. There's a lot of unused land. There's a big sun, a uh, huge star putting out energy very close by. Very I mean, I think aside, uh, solar and some other, I mean, wind is, I mean, really, you just need to put those windmills out there where there's wind. Mm -hmm. Put them offshore, yeah. put them. Just, paint one of the blades uh, yeah, black. Paint, paint a blade black, exactly. So that and the birds will avoid it. Protect the birds. But the solar panels, I mean, there are issues with chemicals and how long the panels last and the, uh, the, you know, the, the so, garbage and how it, and how, uh, processing the the solar panels. How how good is that for the environment? There's mining and there's other stuff that's involved. In that. Batteries are a huge issue. But the issue. batteries there's, is not such a big issue. It, oh. There are toxic environment issues. But I'm I'm going along with you on this, saying yeah. overall, we could take care of everything if we just put our minds to it. Like yes. you just put the land out there and you make the solar panels and you you make the wires to the solar panels and you make it done. So I mean, so one of the things. Uh, is that was that uh, you don't necessarily need the batteries like this is uh, there's some companies who've been doing this throughout the United States um, where they will lease you uh, solar panels to put on your roof for free. Uh, mm. There's no batteries. What they do is they turn your meter backwards by feeding the grid. So actually, it's all of your neighbors who when you're at work who might be using your solar grid panel right. energy. And as that turns it back, and then when you use energy, you're paying for a difference in some percentage of it. And they're taking uh, uh, some of, they become your electric company, the people who put the solar panels on your roof. Uh, so you can actually have solar panels that are just feeding direct into the grid, just feeding energy in there. And you're sort of getting credit as if you were a power plant. And, and probably more efficiently than a power plant would, because instead of having uh, losing 50% of the energy that's created at the, the the solar farm as it makes its way through the grid to somebody's home, you might lose half of the power that you generated. If that, if that panel is on top of a roof in the neighborhood, feeding the immediate local grid, the efficiency is much, much, much higher. So, you know, the, the old method of, I have solar panels, I will charge batteries and then drain those batteries and then go to the grid if I need to. Is, is sort of the old way of attacking this. The new way is solar panels on my roof, feed my local communities energy mm -hmm. needs, and it uh, reduces the amount that I've taken from the grid, and therefore that's the differentiation that I'm paying. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then you can also, then, then you use uh, geothermal, you use hydroelectric, you use all of the other sources, wind that can feed, feed the grid more regularly, but not everyone needs them all at the same time. Um, you know, I'm, I still think that uh, the combination of things like um, uh, hydrogen fuel cells combined with solar with solar in a house is or in a you know in a house or in a, an industrial installation, an apartment building or something you've got I think I think combinations to get the get the draw off the grid itself and That's there's a company good. working on That's using good. uh spent nuclear waste yeah, fully charged to, right metajuro yes. to create batteries that apparently yeah. would never stop working they don't have the technology yet they're talking about they could do it maybe possibly based on a computer model you know, people are saying the output of those batteries this far has never been proven to be very effective. But maybe you make some really giant batteries that you have as the power plant and keep them very far away from people. <laughs> uh, but apparently, you know, the, yeah. you know, you look at the yeah, half-life of waste. Battery recycling, too. Yeah. Battery recycling. Microwave. But I just saw something. Oh, my God. There was another story that just came out using, like, citrus peels. Using orange peels to get the metals out of batteries and to help with battery recycling. Hmm. Yeah. So there's something in citrus peels that helps isolate um, metals. And so they're going to be using it to like clean metals. Cool stuff. Yeah. So cool. Okay. So do you need uh, more coffee? Do I? I've had too much. 
<laughs> I'm not going to sleep tonight, which is still a really long way away because I had a pot of coffee this morning to wake up. I didn't sleep all the way through the night last night. Oh, ouch. <sighs> yeah, it's very much early. Yeah, probes in space, nuclear batteries. That's true. Hi, kitty cat. Time for bed? For me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Say goodnight, Kiki. <laughs> good night, Kiki. Say good night, Justin. I can't. Oh, say good morning. Say hello. Good, morning, good day. Everybody. Good day, Denmark. <laughs> Have a wonderful, wonderful week, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you back here again next week. For more science, more conversation, and um, I will post information on uh, the This Week in Science Facebook page, maybe, our Patreon. I will, I will find a way to get information out to people about a uh, Friday hangout for Ed. Justin, tell me what time is a good morning time for you on a Saturday? Uh... Is like... Because now is getting too late for me. Yeah. No, I hear <laughs> you. Uh, well, I suppose uh, well, you can start it whenever, and I could just show up late. Or, I mean, I suppose seven, since I don't have to prepare for anything. But that would be uh, four I, in the morning. For but you? that's when I get up for this show anyway, and and mm -hmm. uh, try to become a cogent human being before the show starts i could start the show a little rough and then wake up as the show progresses in the case of, of this perhaps is hanging out with people it's hanging uh, out with no, people more yeah. social uh orientation thing uh yeah so if you wanted to set it at seven i could make that work okay we'll see if uh blair can make it but um cool. yep Something like that. Okay. We'll work through this. We'll figure it out. It may also be better for us to pick a time that it's maybe like my Friday morning. Which would your Friday morning? Would you be your Friday night, right? <laughs> no. I'm I'm nine hours ahead of you. Yeah, so it would be yeah, so oh. if it were not yeah, it would yeah, be your Friday be your Friday works. afternoon. Yeah, that'd be fine. That could be better. For a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it'll be Friday morning next week. Yeah. Remember, okay. people have to work, though, too. They do. So, I don't I know don't. if anybody's working. Is anybody working still? Does people still have jobs anymore? Some, I don't understand. The some world. do. Some do not. We are doing what we can to piece it together. <laughs> okay. I'll see you next week. <sighs> On that positive note, everybody have a wonderful week. I'll see you next week. I look forward to seeing you all. Yes. Good night, everyone. Thank you.